I'd like to call the uh, meeting of the Board of Selectmen for Thursday, October 15th uh, to order at 6.35 p.m. via Zoom. And we are meeting in response to Governor Baker's declaration of public health emergency um, in remotely until further notice. This meeting will be recorded, can be viewed live on Citrate Community Television Facebook Live, and uh, the meeting will be recorded and available tomorrow on Channel 9 and YouTube. Um, I would like to entertain a motion to call the meeting to order and accept the agenda. So moved. So moved by Mr. Vignani, seconded by Second. Ms. Curran. Um, as we are meeting remotely, we are required every vote to be taken by roll call. Ms. Canfield? Yes. Mr. Vignani? Yes. Ms. Conley? <clears throat> yes. Ms. Con <laughs> Ms. Curran? Yes. Mr. Goodrich? Yes. Great. Thank you. The meeting and the agenda are accepted. Um, we have a lot to cover tonight. Uh, I'm going, we will launch into that shortly, but I, a couple of things I, I really wanted to um, just make note of before we start. Uh, our community has very recently lost two of our, our giants. Um, Jake Kennedy and J.L. Murphy have passed. Um, I'm sure you've all heard and uh, their contributions to our community and um, and to the region were unparalleled. So the board just wanted to make note and to send our condolences and appreciations to both their families. Um, the other thing I would like to take a moment to bring to the boards and the community's attention is an important topic that's been impacting almost every aspect of our lives these days. And I'm not really talking about COVID, but I'm talking about the heightened sen um, tensions that are surrounding the upcoming elections and the increasing number of public events that are support both candidates and specific causes. While I personally applaud those who are using their voices to increase awareness and engagement, I strongly condemn those who would use these opportunities, either in person or on social media, to harass, bully, demean, threaten, or harm any of our neighbors, your neighbors. As the community, the board has not had an opportunity to discuss this disturbing trend, but I personally wanted to state as an elected leader in this town, I will not tolerate this behavior in any aspect within my control or my influence. I would also like to acknowledge the extreme pressure that these behaviors are having on our public safety officers. They are charged with keeping the peace and because of the actions of what I hope are a very small group of agitators, they must now walk the tightrope between protecting residents from harm and allowing people to express their opinions. I commend all of our officers for their skill, professionalism in finding this balance, and especially our chief of police for his leadership and his really incredible open door policy um, to speak to whomever needs to, um, would like his attention. This is a challenging and a difficult time, and I urge all of Situate to recognize the pressures on all of our departments. And when you see a, a town employee or an officer, please join me in thanking them for their service. So I really felt it was really important to say something about uh, the current climate because, um, you know, we have great people in this community. We have great people that work for the community, and we need to stand together um, because that's really what we're, we're all about. And the last thing I want to say is, to mention to my colleagues on the board that um, you know anybody that's trying to work from home in the COVID situation, we're all working twice as hard in our, our real jobs. And on top of that, they have committed to really stepping up in a challenging time for our community. So I thank my fellow board members for that as well. So that's enough of me. Oh, and then there's the phone. <laughs> I'm gonna mute and see if anybody else on the board has anything that to say before we launch. <laughs> I can, I can uh, t uh, just give my two cents here. First of all, uh, Karen, I want to say that was very well stated. Um, I, too, um, give my full support to the police department in the town and, um, and their efforts to keep pace, uh, peace and safety in our community. Um, I've been doing this for about over 12 years now, and I've witnessed and I've heard of all the wonderful events that they've done and, and achievements that they've done um, over that time period. Um, unfortunately, in the political climate that we're dealing with right now, um, people are going to hear that and twist it and translate it to, to say that um, we're against other initiatives. And clearly that's not the case. 
um, as you'll, you'll see we're talking about later on this evening, um, we support any type of, um, of uh, any type of effort that gets rid of any sort of social inequalities. Um, and those two supporting the police and working towards that are not um, counterintuitive. Um, so um, I hope that I hope that that nobody twists it into meeting that that um, our police department does a great job. That doesn't mean there's not room for improvements, and that's part of the reason why we're we're looking at things and, and trying to make things better for everybody here. Um, I read somewhere that I think is appropriate. This um, you know just because we say that we want to save the whales does not mean that we want to harm the dolphins. So I hope that people don't put those two issues together and, uh, and do bad math to come to that conclusion. So um, I agree with your statement there, Karen, and, and well said. Thank you, Mr. Vignani. Um, I'd like to just give an opportunity for anybody else before we launch into the meeting. If not, we will. I'll just say I completely agree with both statements. Um, and I, I'd like to make a comment when we get a little bit closer to um, the committee review, Karen, if I may. Absolutely. Look forward to it. All right. Thank um, you, Karen Tony. You're welcome. Um, the next item on our agenda is uh, walk-ins, or as they're now known as Zoom-ins. If you would like to participate in this meeting um, and this portion of the meeting, I do see a raised hand, figured it out. You go to participants and at the bottom you'll see a raised hand. Um, we do have one. If you are watching live stream on Facebook, you can only um, watch. If you want to participate, you need to go to the Zoom link on the agenda on the town website. So with that, I will ask Kate. Let's see. Hold on. Trying to unmute you. Ask you. All right. Kate Fart Fartnick, is it? Fartnick, Hi. yep. If you would mind uh, giving us your name and address, please. Sure. Um, first, thank you for taking my comment. Um, my name is Kate Fardink. I live at 10 Pine Brook Lane. Um, I am the parent of two situate elementary school students, and I've recently been participating in the school um, committee's diversity, equity, and inclusion subcommittee. We've recently been watching the events unfold, as you mentioned, on this topic throughout our town. Um, and I think we can all agree at least on one part of this, that it has been amazing to see our young people, our students, our younger residents step up and stand for what they believe in, agree with them or not. I think they're just, it's amazing that they have these voices and they're willing to, to, to speak out. Unfortunately, like you said, they and all of us who've been working towards this common goal have been met with a lot of resistance. Most of it has been particularly loud and a lot of it has been on social media. And more unfortunately, because those speaking out seem to be very louder or more vocal, it may come off that they are the majority and speaking for others. But I want to be clear, especially if there are any of those students watching today, they are not alone and many, many residents stand with them and the people of color in our community. I applaud your efforts, the selectmen's efforts um, as well, <clears throat> excuse me, um, for the committee that you're looking to establish tonight at a town level. But again, this important work I feel is at, in danger of being derailed by a small but vocal group. So today I'm gonna ask one question of you as you inter interview for these very important positions to please stand by the original charge for the advisory committee, which stated its purpose as advancing equity and justice for all with a focus on eradicating from the town of Situate oppression, racism, injustice, and violence against oh. all. This can only be done if every single member appointed to that board is willing to admit and accept that racism is alive and well in situate today. Countless voices has, have come forward on multiple platforms in the last few months with their own experiences. And anything less than a full confrontation of our issues should not be accepted. Others' opinions on anti-racism or the history of racism in this town cannot ever trump the experiences of the people of color that have bravely spoken out. The only way that I believe our community can really move forward with this very important work is if those that you choose to lead can accept and admit publicly that they believe that we should move forward as a, as a community that believes in anti-racism and that we have a problem. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And again, I, I applaud you for taking on this topic, especially in the middle of a pandemic. And um, good luck. Thank you. 
Kate, thank you so much for those comments. Um, we do, I see one other hand raised for the Zoom in portion. So I'd like to invite Mr. Esch, Tom Esch, and ask to unmute. If you would just state your name and address for the record, that would be great. Sure, it's um, Tom Esch. Uh, we live at 50 Lawson Terrace. Um, we have a, a second grade son in, uh, in the Situate Public Schools at Cushing. Um, and my wife and I wanted to speak up in the strongest possible terms uh, about our belief that the Advisory Committee on Equity and Justice for All should be guided, continue to be guided by principles that are explicitly anti-racist. Um, Situate, as we all know, is an overwhelmingly white Christian town. Um, and I think it's to our credit that, to, that residents have responded largely positively uh, to the challenges presented uh, by the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but more importantly to the events and systemic racism that precipitated the movement. Um, to back down from that, I think would be a real disservice to the town, uh, to families, to all families here, and especially to, uh, to our kids. Um, we also find it pretty hard to believe that anyone, anyone would take issue with a commitment to ensuring that everyone who enters our community would be treated with respect and dignity. Um, I would echo Kate's comments about the, the, I suppose, um, vocal nature of a small number of people. Um, and we, we really hope that the, uh, the Board of Selectmen uh, maintains its commitment um, to the ideas. Uh, I think we're incredibly lucky to have a chance not to dilute that commitment, but to ensure that Situate is a town of equity and inclusion. And I would, I would join um, others in urging you to remain true to the original charge mm -hmm. of the committee. That's all. Great, I appreciate your comments. Thank you so much. Um, we will be um, revisiting our statement uh, that we proposed last week um, before we start the um, before we start the interviews themselves. So uh, we would like to. Are there any? I don't think there are any other hands raised for walk-in. We will go on to our six forty, which is the report of our town administrator, Mr. Bedro. I'll be very brief tonight. I know we have a full agenda. Uh, just on COVID, we've had three new cases since Tuesday, two on mm -hmm. Tuesday, uh, one on Tuesday, two today. And those are three separate addresses. We still remain yellow. Our two-week positivity rate is up to 1.5%. That's up from 1.29% the previous week. So we are still seeing high numbers in situ. We need people to be cautious. We need them to wear their masks, uh, social distance, and do the things they need to do. Uh, I know some people probably saw on the paper and on the news uh, an outbreak in surrounding towns caused by a youth, youth hockey tournament. Um, so we asked the parents of the youth that are participating in these youth sports to make sure that their teams are following the guidelines that they need to follow because when you have an outbreak like that, it ends up getting into your schools. And at least one school in Marshfield has now gone remote for two weeks uh, in part because of the outbreak at the hockey tournament. So please follow the rules, do what you need to do and help us stay open, help us keep school open, and help people stay safe and healthy. Uh, on a good news, uh, the reservoir was up 3.5 inches from the recent rainstorm. We got uh, over one and a half inches over the last seven days at the treatment plant, and we had to do more this week. Uh, our usage was down. Again, it was less than 600,000 gallons per day to the treatment plant for the first time in months. Uh, mm -hmm. So we are moving in the right direction. Hopefully with the rain and the change, uh, a long change in the weather pattern, that reservoir will start filling up quickly, but we still are in an extreme drought in southeastern Massachusetts, and we ask people to continue to save water, do not do the outside watering, do not water your plants, uh, and we'll be able to get that water level back up to where it needs to be. Um, three other things real quick. The Cedar Point construction play uh, is going on. There have been some major disruptions out there in terms of traffic. Uh, every day I get another picture of pipes that are completely broken, pipes that are not attached, uh, which means that the storage from that particular house is going into the ocean and the ocean is going into the storage plant. So we found numerous instances of that. So to say that this is going to have a huge impact on I&I could be an understatement. Uh, what we're seeing out there is much worse than we had anticipated. So the bang for the buck we're going to get out of this project is going to be, uh, we think, pretty large. So we ask people to be patient, uh, beware of the construction, follow the directions of the police officers and the signs. Uh, and we'll get through that construction out there. The Cole Parkway Marina project will stop Monday. Uh, this is putting the piling, the marina on pilings, similar to the uh, Maritime Center across the harbor. 
There's a much better way to do it. This is gonna be an all winter project. It is scheduled to be completed long before the boats go back on the water, but it will mean some disruption in Cole Parkway, some loss of parking spots and a redirection of the traffic. Those signs have gone up. Uh, people will be able to follow pretty easy and we'll have a map up of that before Monday uh, when those detours start in Cole Parkway. <laughs> Finally, uh, Halloween. Uh, the Commonwealth has issued guidelines for Halloween or trick-or-treating. We're going to put those up as soon as we can find a clean copy of them. Uh, but basically, Halloween is allowed. Uh, Front Street Halloween event will not be taking place this year, but Halloween is going to be allowed. People will be able to trick-or-treat. We'll put up the safety guidelines. We'll go into those in more detail on Monday. Uh, but no house parties, no indoor activities. Uh, stay with your families. Uh, make sure you social distance. Wear masks while trick-or-treating and not Halloween masks, but actual masks like we're wearing now. Uh, make sure you really wash your hands afterwards, but we'll post those guidelines. And I think people can still go out and enjoy Halloween and trick-or-treating, uh, if not the way they always have, at least uh, as close to normal as we can make it this year. That's all I have for right now. Great, thanks, Jim. So just a reminder, everybody, town business is going on. As important as tonight's conversation is, there's a lot going on. And Good. And back to the point of everybody working so hard and we appreciate it. Um, the next item on our agenda for 645 is to vote, discuss a special event. It's a woman's rally for justice. And I believe Martha Cook is presenting. Martha, if you would please just identify yourself and your address before you begin, that'd be great. Up, oh, you're waving, you're muted. You should be unmuted now. Okay, hi, uh, <laughs> my name is Martha Cook. I live at 3 Acorn Street here in town. Um, I am the host of Saturday's Women's March. It's what they call a little sister version of the more well-known National Women's March. Um, all across the country, every 50 states has these. We're having over 350 all together this weekend. And um, people might be more familiar with the big ones that have taken place in urban areas, but obviously this is yet another thing that because of COVID, is going to be very different, very scaled back, very um, simple and um, just more intimate and, and again, safer. Um, unlike where you may have seen people shoulder to shoulder in the past, uh, everybody at our event will be at least six feet apart. Um, my preference was eight feet. We are going to use American flags as placeholders and so Every attendee will be directed to go stand by a flag. Those were all donated by Wallace St. John of Eagle Flag in Cohasset. And he, I, I asked, um, then do you want me to pick them up and take, bring them back to you? And he said, oh no, they're my gift. Everybody should take one home. Everybody should have a flag going into election season. So um, you get a free flag if you come. It's like a perfect <laughs> favor. <laughs> um, the, the goal of the event, I was uh, thinking about what you said at the very beginning of the meeting, Ms. Canfield, is that um, I, we've all noticed that in this current climate, there's been a lot of um, people who aren't familiar with how government works. They might be less civic aware than um, I would like to see people. So my goal is to bring people together, to educate them, uh, to encourage them to vote, to reassure them that our ballots in situate are very safe, that the state of Massachusetts does a great job and our town clerk's office is very trustworthy. Um, I, I have no fear that whether you vote in person or early or via mail, you will be able to be heard and that's very important. Um, so standing together and pulling together is absolutely part of our goal. We, we wanna bring people together in a friendly way it's a very nonpartisan march. Um, each individual host of those over 350 gatherings decides on a theme, topic, speakers. Um, mine is very nonpartisan. Uh, I was joking with a friend who said that um, some of the marches are being billed as grannies marches. And I thought that sort of was appropriate that this is gonna be very G-rated it's not leaning politically one way or the other. I'm uh, more interested in just inspiring patriotism, the support of our country. We're gonna have music. There will be patriotic songs as well as more well-known pop songs. Um, we just wanna inspire people. A lot of moms are planning to bring their daughters. So uh, we're gonna be modeling 
good behavior for our kids so that they see what women leaders look like. We have a number of speakers. Uh, they all have good topics. I'm happy to share more if you have questions about the speakers or the COVID safety. Um, great, thank you, Martha. Yeah, we did, um, just so everyone knows, when you, when you wanna have an event like this, you, um, you get in touch with the Board of Selectmen office and they can help you do an application. And the application's purpose is to make sure we have all of the ducks in a row, uh, mostly for public safety, but also for um, just logistics. Mm -hmm. And especially in COVID, it's, it's really important to do that. Um, I have a couple questions, but I'll open it up to the board if they have any they like to lead with. Anyone? No, shaking heads. Um, Mara? I, could I have one question. Yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't know if I was on mute or not. Um, Martha, thank you. I know it sounds like a great event. How are you going to manage um, how many people show up? That was one of my questions looking at the application. Um, the National Women's March organizers have a map, a nationwide map with pins that show all the different marches. And um, that is the only public notification that has happened at all. Um, we've been approached by the Mariner. I said, no, thank you. I've been approached by people in town who belong to groups who asked if they could do uh, an email blast to all their members. I said, no, thank you. <laughs> really don't want to do that. Uh, in my mind all along, I've been assuming it was possible that we would move into the red zone. So I've always had the number 50 in my head. Um, it's like planning a wedding at a small event, <laughs> small venue. Uh, I've been thinking all along, we can only have 50, only have 50. Um, so on the National Women's March website link, that, which is the only way people find out about it, other than word of mouth, uh, they RSVP. I have their emails and their phone numbers. Uh, if we had a hurricane coming, I would be blasting out a message to all those people to say, oh, sorry, wouldn't be safe to be outside. Um, I, can, I have been messaging those people, reminding them that uh, everybody will be standing at a safe social distance, that everybody will be wearing a mask. And um, so right now, that's the only, uh, only kind of uh, information that's being passed. Uh, if tonight we're given the permission to go ahead, I know there are some people who are chomping at the bit to, again, bring their teenage daughter along or um, tell a good friend who's you know, on the fence about, I don't know if I want to come or not. So uh, we'll see what happens after you vote. Okay, thank you. Great, uh, any other questions from the board? No, okay. Oh, Ms. Connolly. I had to unmute myself because the dog was barking. Um, Martha, so what happens if 50 people uh -oh. Karen, you're, you're hiccuping. I'm sorry, I can't hear her. I think, I, uh, Karen, you just froze. Sick. I think she was saying, what happens if too many people shows up, show up? Yeah. I don't know what just happened. Oh, were you just asking if too many people show up, what, what's the plan? Let's assume that's the question. <laughs> I'll ask that question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Goodrich. I, I, think, I think it is my, my it's, it's frozen. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the um, dual purposes of those American flags is that each attendee goes to stand by a flag. We know how many flags we're putting out. Um, people have to stay in the spot by their flag. And so that's a, a counting mechanism. We also have a hand clicker. Um, we don't anticipate more people. I, like I said, I have an RSVP list. Our, did I say that right? Our, respond yeah. to Google Play. Yeah, I have that list. <laughs> um, many of the volunteers are included in that list. So it's not two separate groups. It's not the speakers and the DJ, their names, they're part of my RSVP list. So I don't anticipate huge crowds Again, uh, thank goodness for our local weatherman, Mr. Wonkum. Uh, I've been watching the weather very carefully. 
I know a lot of people won't come because of the rain that's forecast. Uh, I think with any major event, there's always a percentage of people who intend to be there and then don't. I've already had a few people today contact me and say they've either had a work obligation come up or a child care problem. And so numbers are, you know, peeling off just a little bit right now. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, Martha. I have just a couple of logistic thank questions. Um, the fire department uh, did um, raise the concern about a, an extension cord. Have you addressed that? Yes. I spoke to Michelle Segeze and she said she'd pass the message back along to them. Um, you should have copies of the map I did, which was an overhead. Yep. Uh, and then I put a translucent drawing on top of that to show where our things fit into that. Um, the long cement driveway that bisects town hall and the park, uh, the, the lawn mm -hmm. um, is our kind of breakwater. The DJ, the tables, all that are on the building side. There's one electrical outlet with two plugs. It's just to the um, north side of the front door portico behind the shrubs and flowers. The DJ and I both agreed that we would not want to run an extension cord more than 50 feet. And so we've mapped out that if you walk toward the sidewalk and make a little turn, that's only about 40 feet. And that gives him a solid safe place to put the table. We will have a canopy to protect him if, if the rain comes. And um, that way the microphones will hook into that. And so that will all be on the building side. So no extension cords will run across the driveway. Great. Um, and the last question I had was um, just a, not, not a question, that's just a comment. I did notice in their application that this event will be starting after um, in-person early voting yes. is occurring. So uh, please don't, uh, I think they're, you're not even setting up until that's closed. Is that correct? Right. Well, um, or just you. When I, when I spoke to Ms. Gardner, right, she did say, please don't start anything till after 12. Um, we would be aware of the fact that people will still be parked there and there could be people on the sidewalk. Um, so we won't do anything that would block parking or, or make it hard for people to go. The, um, the concept of putting flags in the ground is a slower concept because we have to use tape measures and go eight feet between each flag. And so I think we might start that a little earlier, unless it's a deluge, just because of the fiddliness of that process of making sure that there's eight feet in each direction. Mm -hmm. The other day when I attempted it, the ground was so rock hard, it, it, just putting each flag in was time consuming. And I only tried three. So if you multiply that, I want, I want, to, I want, to, allow, I want to allow a lawn of American flags would be a distraction for people who are there to vote. So I hope that that's okay. If not, we will just get them all in between 12 and one, but I'd rather start that portion of it a little earlier, just so that we're not um, slamming them in at the, at the last minute. Yeah, I have no problem. I have no problem. Ooh, are we echoing? Are we echoing? Um, okay. Uh, okay. Does anyone have Does anyone any have comments? Any comments? I don't. Um, am I echoing to you guys? Okay, all better. Okay. Uh, does anyone um, attending the meeting want to raise a hand? Do they have a question or a comment about this event? I'm scrolling through and do not see any hands raised. Would anyone, uh, I would entertain a motion if the board would like to make a motion. There are no further questions. Any motions? Are we here? Yeah, we're here. <laughs> Looking for the language. Move to approve a special event permit to Martha Cook for the Women's Rally for Justice on October 17th, 2020, from 1 to 2 p.m. Second. Second. Second by Ms. Curran. Uh, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, we will do a roll call vote. Danfield? Yes. Mr. Vignani? Yes. Ms. Conley? Yes. Ms. Curran? Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. The, uh, the motion move is passed unanimously. Uh, there is a second part of the, uh, the application. 
that requested that we waive the special event fee of $100, um, which it seems to be um, becoming a normal request. <laughs> um, would What resources, Martha, are you guys going to be using from the town other than the town site? And electricity. Yeah, I was going to say, are you counting the plug-in for the, I mean, so we, we would be using some town electricity. Um, no police, no barricades, no, um, again, I, I can't think of anything. We hope to leave the site cleaner than we found it. We will provide our own trash barrels. Um, we have masks, gloves, hand sanitizer, trash barrels, trash cans, um, lots of volunteers. Again, the flags would have been the thing I was worried about. I spoke to um, a friend of mine, known to all of you from the Water Resources Committee, who said, you know, people get really um, sensitive if a flag is accidentally knocked over. He said, you have to really be on top of that. So obviously we are. And um, I, I, again, all the people who attend are free to take home a flag. If they don't, we will collect them back all up again. So I can't think of any resources that we would be using. Uh, does the board have any comments or questions about the special event fee? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I, I, I'm not gonna, this isn't the time that I wanna go into this, but we're literally waiving it for every event. So we should really discuss whether it really should exist, period. Um, you know, we used, to we used to waive it for, for two events that were, I mean, there are administrative costs that are associated with any event. Um, whether it's $100 or $46, I don't know. But, um, but every group is just coming before us now and asking to waive it. So I think we should have another meeting and discuss whether we're gonna deal with this on every event or not. And Martha, that has nothing to do with your cause or stuff. Um, it's just becoming the norm. Thank you. Jim, would you mind uh, reminding us to put that on an agenda in the future to revisit the uh, special event fee and its application? All right, in this case, is anyone interested in making a motion? Move to waive the special event fee of $100. Moved by Ms. Connolly, is there a second? Second, second. by Mr. Goodrich. Any further comments? Did anyone hear? Uh, comments? I think so. Um, then we will have a roll call vote. Ms. Canfield. Yes. Mr. Vignani. No. Ms. Conley. Ms. Conley? Oh, yes. Proven. She said yes. <laughs> Ms. Karen? Yes. Mr. Goodrich? Yes. All right, the motion passes 4-1. Uh, good luck, Martha. I'm, I'm disappointed that I won't be able to join you. I have family commitment that day, so it sounds like a good event. Thank you. Well. Um, we are hoping that it will be filmed and we'll be able to share it with people who are unable to attend. Perfect, thank you. All right, um, okay. we will then- Thank you. Move on thank you. To, yeah, thank you for all your organizing. Um, we'll now move on to our 655, which is to uh, discuss about the revised diversity, equity, and inclusion statement. Um, as everyone knows, we have, um, we presented, I believe, two weeks ago and, um, uh, had some conversation and decided that we needed to to improve it some and I would like to ask uh, my colleague Ms. Curran to take the lead on um, that conversation and do would you like me to screen sh save the uh, um, if you want to do you want to I can try <laughs> if you want okay over to Ms. Curran Okay, so thank you, Mrs. Canfield. Um, in response to some of the commentary that I think we all heard um, at our last meeting, uh, Karen and I met again and kind of looked at the language and, and thought, okay, where can we add some additional uh, sentences and phrases in here that address some of the um, issues that were raised um, and sent to us uh, in the last review. So. Um, does everybody on the board have the um, new draft statement in front of them? Yes. Yes. Um, I'll read it out loud so everybody can hear it and um, then we can talk about it if that sounds good. 
Um, so revised language reads, the town of Selectman unequivocally condemns racism, discrimination, and hate in all its forms in our community. We work to ensure that Situate is a welcoming community that embraces diversity, equity, and inclusion. As elected leaders, we recognize our responsibility to understand and address all racial inequality. We have a duty ourselves, residents, employees, and businesses to ensure that everyone who enters into it is treated with respect and dignity. To that end, we pledge to work to educate ourselves, town employees, and town residents on racial justice issues. We will review our existing policies, practices, and procedures, and where necessary, in changes to build a stronger, more equitable community. We will encourage diversity of voices and representation on with town boards and committees. The Board of Selectmen further pledged to work on behalf of all residents and ensure that Situate is a place where all individuals can live happily, free of fear, and with equal access to opportunities regardless of race, ethnic background, national origin, religion, gender identity, or sexual orientation. Um, so with that, I think I would just ask my board members for um, any commentary or thoughts. I'm going to stop sharing because then I can see everybody. Um, Martha, uh, Mara, thank you so much for that. Um, people, uh, residents should realize that um, there was a great deal of input and thoughtful comments from other residents and um, we tried to reflect a lot of those in the revised language um, and you saw the just the colored um, the highlighted um, words were the ones that changed from the original. Uh, would um, anyone on the board like to add any comments to this draft? How do you feel about it? Uh, Mr. Goodrich? I just, I, again, I want to say thank you, Maura, for the work you've done in this. This is excellent to listen to all the, the, the different voices and ours. I just, I think it's an excellent job. So, so thank you. You're welcome. Um, Maura, I mean, uh, Karen or Tony, anything to add to this? Are we happy with this version? I think it's, I think it's very well stated and I support it. I'm in agreement. Okay. Uh, great. I will ask if there are any um, comments or questions from those attending to please go to participants and raise hand if you would like to comment on this final draft of our town statement, well, Board of Selectmen statement, let me revise that. I, oh, I see no hands, so I'm hoping that means everyone thinks it's, we did okay. Um, if there is no further discussion, I will enter, oh, wait, sorry, yeah, Suzanne. Yeah, there's a oh, you jumped onto my screen too, that's pretty cool. All right, we're gonna unmute Suzanne and ask her to give her name and address. Hi. My name is Suzanne O'Brien. I live at 8 Bonnie Breyer Circle. Um, I have two kids in Situate Elementary Schools and a third in preschool. And I have been participating in the Situate Public Schools Subcommittee on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. I want to commend you on preparing the statement that, that you've prepared. I think it's a great start. Um, I wonder you know, if you were coordinating and aligning with the school and the statement that they're preparing, or if you've had a chance to look at that. And the reason I raised that issue is I feel like the statement that the school is preparing is taking the next step and making it that much stronger, acknowledging that racism is a problem in our society and in our town specifically. Um, and I don't think acknowledging that is placing blame. You know, I was listening to the last Board of Selectmen meeting. I don't think it's placing blame on employees or people or um, pointing fingers at anyone. It's racism is a fact. It's it's here. It's built into our systems. It's built into our processes. It's built into our communities. So I, my issue with the statement is it doesn't really acknowledge that, and it's hard to solve a problem that you're not really specifically naming. And further, you know, there's um, a word that you may have heard of anti-racism, and it's taking active steps to try to eliminate racism. And I feel like a lot of the concepts that you touch on in your statement get to anti-racism, but, but you don't really name that either. So 
just a couple of thoughts that I had when I was scanning the statement that I wanted to put on the record. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Ms. Bryan. I, um, this is very interesting comment. And um, um, I, uh, the board originally, back when we decided that we needed this, this committee formed, did not make a statement, did not choose to make a statement because, hi mom, <laughs> because um, we felt that we may not have the right words and that that would be something that just as the school has done would be um, a, a, one of the first things that we would look to the committee to draft and craft with us. The feedback we got from those who have been very passionate about this were we needed to make a statement to give the um, board, the new committee, um, um, real support out of the gate. So it's an interesting, like, you know, which comes first. Um, our initial feeling was indeed that we need to have more input on this before we make craft it. Um, I've not personally seen any of the drafts from the school, um, but I do think that we've come pretty um, close to articulating our commitment. I mean, it, you know, it can always be stronger, but the fact that we're saying eradicate racism in my little wordsmith mind is, I, I really think says, you know, it's here, so we have to eradicate it. So um, I do, I get, I totally get what you're saying. Does anyone on the board have further uh, response to that? But it's, it is a very good point. Um, I'm not seeing anyone's hands raised. Oh, Ms. Connolly, and let's yeah, see. Yeah, I, I, I will say, I think, I think the effort we are making as a board is to um, position this committee as, as a positive force within our community and that we are striving to be as positive as possible. I think the first sentence acknowledges that there is racism in situate. It is, pre pre it, it is prevalent throughout our society. Um, I, for one, and I, I'm sure I'm gonna get myself in trouble, but I'll say it. I would prefer that we not get so stuck on words at this point. I'm looking for this committee to get formed and for them to take action. And uh, by having meetings that are open to the public, that we can have forums for people to discuss all of their issues. And if at the end of the day, at some point, they would like to craft a stronger statement after they have defined you know, what the problems are here in Situate, then I would embrace that. So um, I appreciate everyone's input and it's getting to be a little confusing. Um, so I, I, for one, would like us to approve the statement and move ahead and get this committee formed and get them going. And I did look at the, uh, the school committee is 60 people. That's a lot of people. So, and they have not communicated with this board, as far as I know, as to what statements they're crafting. So I think that's something that our new board needs to start to get in touch with the schools to try to figure out, you know, that we're all going in the right direction. So I thank you for your comments. All right, I do see a couple more hands. Uh, I'd like to, um, I'll call on Kim Harriman because I don't believe you've addressed us right now. And there we go. Uh, Kim, if you could give us your name and address. Yes, hi everyone. Everyone, um, thank you so much for your work on this. My um, address is 40 Driftway in Situate, and I, I'm very happy to be here and proud of my community as always for doing the right thing. Um, and thank you to the Board of Selectmen, Selectmen for all you do all the time for your community. I am really grateful to see a statement. I just finished a project at my place of employment, which is Simmons University. I was involved as a faculty member to craft our own statement. And, um, and I, I do agree with Suzanne, who just spoke about the use of anti-racist talk, but I also appreciate what Karen is saying, that there's been a lot of work on this already, and perhaps the committee can revisit down the road. The only one um, phrase I would wonder about, given that you're addressing gender, is uh, in addition to gender identity, gender expression, which is um, really being separated out now as a separate entity um, to be um, respected. So for people who are gender non-conforming um, and who may choose a gender expression that is not in keeping with what their actual um, biological gender may be, it would acknowledge that group um, as a marginalized um, group of people. That's all I have to say, but thank you again. Great, thank you. And we'll be hearing from you later, I believe. <laughs> um, there's, uh, Kurt has his hand raised. I, did Kate put her hand down? There was a hand down, okay. 
Uh, Kurt, I will unmute you if you could give us your name and address, please. There you are. Uh, wait, hold on, you're still muted. There you go. Okay. Yep, I can hear you. Yeah, Kurt Gunther, 36 Tickner Place, uh, three children in the uh, Situ Public School System. Uh, I think your statement is fine. The uh, statement that um, I believe Ms. O'Brien was uh, referring to the, the other committee, it, it is a, in, incredibly long and wordy. Uh, there are no, uh, to someone to say there are built-in processes and systems of racism uh, in this town or wherever, that's just an opinion, it's not fact or data. I think your, your, your statement is fine. It doesn't need to get any more lengthy or worthy. It makes your point, and, and that's enough. You, you have to move forward with some of this stuff. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Kate has come back. I don't know where you went, but I will. You're unmuted. Kate, if you'd like to make a comment. Uh, Sorry. Um, I did just want to say, I know uh, the school committee is voting on um, that on resolution wording resolution on Monday. Um, and it was 60 people that spoke about it. We met in subcommittees and we were lucky enough to have many of our METCO students who are members of our community um, and many people of color on that committee. They spoke loudly and clearly and said that they have experienced racism in our town. Their stories are appalling. If we wanna say there's no data on that, I'm, their word is enough for me. And it was very important to them that we would say that we are moving forward in an, as an anti-racist community. I know we don't wanna split hairs, but I also don't wanna leave any loopholes that could be exploited later and make these people who have been brave enough to speak out feel like they're being victimized again. So again, I'm sorry that I'm like pushing a word or it may seem like that, um, but I just think it's very important that people who have, are going to get the most from this statement. Don't look at it and say, well, that was all really nice and they, they put this out, but it's missing something. So I, I, if you did wanna see what the school committee has, I'm sure they would be happy to provide it because that, my understanding is that it, it is done. Um, but yeah, that, that's all I have. Sorry about that. No, not at all. Thank you so much for that. I mean, the, one of the wonderful things about this process is so many very, Passionate, thoughtful, and creative people. Um, I see one more hand. Um, Jean, I'll unmute you. Ask you to please state your name and address for the record, please. Let's see if you pop up. There you are. <laughs> Hi. Um, yes, Jean Schultnick, 511 Hatherley Road. And um, yes, I just wanted to repeat my comments from two weeks ago to express my disappointment that the acknowledgement of racism here in our town is not included in this. In the statement, I think the uh, the words from the charge for this committee come much closer to acknowledging that. And I'm not sure why, if it exists in the charge, why can't it be put in the statement as well? Because those things are not not going to be looked at together. One is a charge for the committee. The one the other is a statement from the board of board of selectmen. And I I, I still think it's very important to have a, have that acknowledgement of racism in there and. Um, you know, I, I also support the addition of, of anti-racism terminology, but I think it's most important to have an acknowledgement of, of what, the, what the reality is here in Situate right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jane. Um, I don't see any other hands raised um, from the public. Um, we've had some really interesting comments. Um, how does the board feel about, um, uh, does the board have any, inclination to revise the language on that's been proposed. Is anyone? Nope. Uh, we got uh, two. Yes, Karen. I think the first sentence says it. I don't know how more clear we can be that we condemn racism, et cetera, et cetera, in our community. I think we say it. Um, I don't understand why that's not a very simple declarative sentence and that we're forming this committee so we can take action. So I feel strongly that, the, I think that the, the um, language is fine as it is. It's been worked on for a couple of months by you know, a number of people led by Maura. And I, at this point, I don't know how much more strongly we can acknowledge there is racism in situate. 
and we say it in the first sentence. So what, uh, Madam? Oh, yes, Laura. Uh, what if we what if we did this if we just inserted in the first sentence because I, I the board wants to move forward we need to make a statement we need to publish it so we can continue to move forward I think there's a fix here that hopefully folks can agree with that if we said the town of Situate Board of Selectmen unequivocally condemns racism discrimination um, and hate in all its forms that is present in our community. Um, People want to noodle that a little bit. I, I would just like to. Yeah, I, I think that's a very elegant way to, um, to make it. I, I, I agree um, with Ms. Connolly that, um, you know, as semantic practice, I think it says that, but to make it stronger, I think causes no harm. Um, so I would not have an objection to that. Um, anyone else feel particularly strong one way or another on that amendment? Because we would like to, I also agree that we, I would like to um, make sure that we commence our interviews with our statement already approved. No? Right. I mean, uh, I agree with, with more that I, I mean, I feel like I want to move forward so we can, we can get this um, actually start the work and there is, I mean, we have to talk about, you know, you know, racism, the beliefs and behaviors and, um, a, a lot of this charge when we're talking about things are about behaviors and, and things that happen. Uh, and if, if I agree with you that I think that's an elegant, I agree with, uh, Mrs. Connolly that it's, I, it's in there that we understand that, um, that we condemn it when it's in our community that we don't, that we're trying to act and, and resolve these things. So um, I, I'm fine with the way it is, but if we'd, if we'd like to add it in, it's, it's fine with me as well. Cause I, I want to get to the point of us addressing these issues and getting the committee formed and finding solutions so our neighbors can feel comfortable. Right. Okay. So the, the, the amendment is proposed to insert after forms present, the word present. That is present. Yeah. That is present, three words, that is present. Okay. Yeah. Um, I also think that the, the point about uh, gender, um, oh my gosh, I just lost the word. What's um, gender expression? Right. Expression, thank you, my brain just went for a walk um, would be an appropriate addition to gender identity and expression. Agreed. Anyone object to that? All right, so we are looking at two proposed changes to the revised language that would say, second sentence, hate in all its forms, that is present in our community. And then after gender identity add um, or expression, and expression or expression? Gender expression. Yeah. Just add, just put it in there. Oh, it's gender expression. Yeah, okay. you just add, add it in before or sexual orientation. Yeah. Okay. Does anyone have further um, comments on this? Mr. Vignani looks like he's. Uh, ready. I'm going to make a motion that we pass it as it was just suggested. As amended. Motion as amended. to Mr. Vignani to approve the statement as amended. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Conley. So further discussion. Seeing none. Let's have a roll call vote. Okay. Sorry, I had to unmute. Yeah. Ms. Canfield? Yes. Mr. Vignani? Yes. Ms. Conley? Yes. Ms. Karen? Yes. Mr. Goodrich? Yes. Terrific. Uh, the motion passes unanimously. I'm very proud of all the work that has gone into it. Thank you again, Ms. Curran, for that. And, um, um, that's great. I think that we'll need to post that immediately on our website and get it out there and um, probably do a press release as well. I think that would be good. All right. Um, okay. Now for our main event. I feel like we don't have sports now, so we have, we'll have to find our, our, our world somewhere else. So uh, we are now to commence our interviews for the uh, board, boards and uh, committees for advisory Committee on Equity and Justice. Um, 
I wanted to just thank everybody that has applied. It, um, it, there have been, I think, I think almost close to, tw not 20, but um, there's 12 or 13 tonight, and there's some several others that couldn't attend tonight that will also um, be interviewed at, uh, on November 3rd. Um, in addition, we received um, a great deal of letters, a lot today. I will apologize to anyone who's listening that wrote a letter. Um, I tried to answer everyone before the meeting and our town hall server crashed, so I will get to you, but um, uh, we saw your letters and I saw your letters and I assume the others got letters as well, um, emphasizing the importance of this work to those residents and also to our community. And the overriding theme of the letters was that the residents feel very strongly that this committee should include people who are firmly committed to eradicating racism in situate and who have a deep understanding about how to do that work. Because it's very, con I've learned a lot from, from a lot of my new friends in the community about this topic and, and it's, it takes, it's gonna take some understanding and, um, of that exactly what has already been voiced by other residents. Um, there are so many that have raised their hands and voices to support this. And to me, that's a testament of how important this work is and how important it is to situate. Uh, before we uh, begin the interviews, I'll just remind everybody about the charge, which I had up. Um, it was referenced earlier today, but um, I, I think everyone here has read the charge. Every committee has been formed um, that is formed by the Board of Selectmen is formed as advisors to us. And their job is to provide recommendations and guidance based on their work. Our job as a board is to assess the recommendations based on not only their merit, but their impact, um, their feasibility, and in some cases, their financial impact on town governance, depending on what the recommendation is. Uh, I wanted to just upfront say that this can be very frustrating to some committees who work passionately on their charge and feel that all the recommendations have to be implemented. Um, and sometimes it's just not possible or it's just not the final decision of the board. Um, I also wanna make clear that the board relies very much on the hard work, the honest deliberation and the advice from our boards and committees. I also wanna make clear that as an advisory body, your job will be to perform the charge of the committee and to advise the board on how to go forward. And it, there's been some confusion, I think, and I just wanted to really iterate that there's no board or committee that has the authority to enact recommendations independent of the board, their advisory. Um, there's no doubt that this work will be, uh, on this committee will be vitally important. It's also going to be extremely challenging. Uh, those of you who already have been involved with the school committee know that you'll be, uh, you'll be in some very, deep conversations because this is an important topic. You'll have to sift through how town of Situate manages town business. You're gonna to have to assess if there are ways to improve the management and remove barriers for inclusion and potentially racially, racially based policies. You will not agree all the time. And this could indeed be emotional work. So I just wanna remind that as representatives, should you be appointed to this board, Representatives are, um, you'll be representatives of both the community and of the board, and you will have to be responsible for your conduct um, and that you conduct your work with professionalism, respect for the committee members, respect for residents, and respect for town employees. Um, I think, I haven't spoken on the board, but I, I would suspect that they would agree on that. Uh, because we have a very full agenda and so many applicants, we're gonna conduct them in, um, probably, uh, we're gonna try to do it in the most efficient way we can to ensure that um, we get to know all of you, um, but that we can get through this without it being midnight. Uh, Ms. Devon uh, did send you an email that said that uh, we're instead of, sometimes when we have uh, uh, one opening, each member of the board will come, you know, have a question, but we usually have um, the same ideas and it just takes longer. So we're just gonna pose four questions to each of you. Um, they'll be the same questions and then um, if the board has any follow-up questions, we'll get to that. We're gonna try to ask you to try to keep your com comments and responses concise. We all do have your applications and your backup material. So, you know, we're familiar with, uh, you know, some of the extraordinary resumes that have been put through and, and passionate statements of why they're, you're in, um, interested in serving. Um, I'll let you know that uh, there, as I said, there are several um, applicants who were not uh, able to join us tonight. Uh, we will be interviewing them on November 3rd 
and um, that we will not be voting on the composition of this board until we have interviewed all of the applicants. So that's a lot of words. I want to put up the questions. Hold on a second. I have to do technology here. Hold on. I want to put up the questions. Um, I, th I think what we'll do is go alphabetical. So I apologize to Ms. Aguchi because <laughs> she will have to be uh, first up. Let me see if I can find the right screen here. Here we go. I'm there. <laughs> well, we're not to you yet. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Hold on. I've got the wrong one up. Madam Chair, may I um, just make yeah. a comment before? Yes, we before we, yeah, uh, Ms. Aducci, before we get to you, I would like to open it to the board if they would like additional comments. Plus, I need the time to find the questions. <laughs> do, I, uh, I, do you want me to make the comment while you're finding the questions? Yes, please. Okay. Laura, before you go, can I just ask a, a procedural question? So, sure. uh, Karen, what are we thinking? Like, like 10 minutes or so per person? Oh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Vignani. I, you reminded me, and since you reminded me, I would like to ask if Mr. Vignani, we would like to keep it to about 10 minutes if possible. I know it's important, but we've got 10 peop uh, uh, 12 people to get through tonight. Um, and I will ask Mr. Vignani, who is the, um, a gentleman and a scholar, to gently remind us if we are going over those times. Thank you, Mr. Vignani. Um, Ms. Curran, would you like to? I do, thank you. Um, I get more questions. Thank you. Can you I just would be remiss if I didn't make a statement about this committee, especially in light of what happened this weekend. Um, this past weekend's events um, have had a really profound effect on me, um, as they did on many residents in this town. Um, so I just want to assure all the residents in Situate that I take the mission and the charge of this committee very, very seriously, and that it arose out of the need to take pause and to evaluate our current policies our practices and our procedures as town government to ensure that we are um, operating in a fair and equitable manner. And there, there is work to be done. But my expectation is that the members that we appoint to this committee will all be deliberate, objective, thoughtful, and most importantly, respectful of their neighbors and our town employees, including our public safety employees during any committee discussions. Situate is such a wonderful community, and we have come together in the past to move forward and make progress, and I am confident that we can continue to address the current concerns and move forward in a respectful manner. And, and I, I just want to put that out there because that is going to be top of mind for me as I listen to all the wonderful applicants that we have before us, because I think great things can happen as a result of this committee if we work together in the way that we have worked together in the past, which is in a, a respectful go forward banner. So thank you, Chairman, for giving me that moment. You're on mute, Karen. So I said so many great things just then. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mara. I, I echo uh, what you said and I appreciate you taking the time to to really articulate that. Um, before we move on to our first applicant, would anyone from the board um, like to add anything to this discussion before we start the interviews? I do wanna just, did, is Tony just on? Uh, okay. Um, all right, so we're, since we're going alphabetically, I will uh, find my piece of paper. Um, it, our first is Ms. Aducci, who, for the board that is on your electronic backup, page 42 is her application. Um, can we, where are we? Can we unmute? Sorry, I've got, since I'm sharing, you're unmuted? Okay. You Excuse would me, Karen. Yes. Karen, they don't, they don't have the electronic backup. They have the paper book. Oh, okay. Well, you can find it. Thank you, Lorraine. The voice behind the curtain is Lorraine who takes care of running everything. Um, all right, so is uh, Nicole. Hi. Where are you? Are you on video? I am, yeah, hi there. Okay, you know what it is? I've got this stupid screen save, so, or share. There you are, hi. Nice <laughs> to meet you. Okay, so would you please just say your name and address, and then um, I will just, you can see the questions. Um, what I'd like to do is I'll read them for you as the first, um, 
um, applicant, and then I'll stop the stupid screen save so I can see everybody. How about that? Um, so the first question is obvious. Uh, our charge uh, specifies, as we've said, working to eradicate oppression, racism, injustice, and violence against all people. Why do you think this work is important? Um, I think just given the reason that we're all here today and the conversation that I'm watching unfold here on this call and uh, within our communities, whether it be in line at Lucky Finn as you're driving around the Rotary in situate, um, the town is going through a lot of really um, difficult changes. And I think that um, we, the only way that we can go far is if we go together. Um, I think it is incredibly important that this committee is able to um, be actively anti-racist. Um, and I think most of all that the youth in our community, especially the students, really deserve um, a group of adults who are there to support them um, with tangible resources, who are there to um, lift up their voices. Um, and I think uh, as well that it's extremely vital for us right now to amplify underrepresented voices in situate. Um, I think for a really long time we've had a lot of homogenous voices. Um, going around and I think, um, frankly, I think folks feel like the only platform for their voice is Situate Monthly, um, which isn't the most productive place um, to have these conversations. And so um, I think form the forming of this committee to be actively anti-racist, actively anti-sexist, actively anti-xenophobic in our community is absolutely vital, um, not only today, but moving forward um, as we continue for our town to grow. Great. What, um, what skills and experience do you think you could bring to further this charge? Yeah, so um, I'm very fortunate. I have had seven years of experience um, building my own pedagogy um, and building inclusion, equity, and belonging initiatives, both in higher education and in tech spaces in Boston, <clears throat> the UK, um, LA. I'm very fortunate to have had these experiences. Um, I have dedicated my, my life to this work. I think it's um, critical to our survival as neighbors and as a humanity um, to deepen our understanding of each other by sharing our narratives. Um, and so that is my life's work, um, is to amplify underrepresented voices. Um, and, you know, like I said, more tangibly, I've spent seven years um, actively working in the space. Um, and so I think that I'm, um, it's what I'm doing is very topical um, and I'm doing it every day. So um, I'm able to advise very actively. Thank you. Um, the charge recommends that members may be useful, which members we thought would be useful to the committee. Do you think that the proposed composition of the committee is appropriate to meet these goals? It's hard to say, I wanna say yes, but it's hard to see if something is going to work until you do it. Um, when I was doing my um, education degree, um, that was a lot of what I was experiencing was it's really easy to kind of talk about things and talk of the theory of things and is this going to work, but until you're actually doing the work and until you've got it up on its feet, it's really hard to know if it's going to work. On paper, I, I've got two thumbs up, um, but by the same token, I think that um, this type of committee is something that deserves to be living and breathing. Um, and so I would think that this committee um, would come to the board with that type of advisement to say, you know, we might be missing um, a seat on this committee where, you know, this is a vital resource that we're really not tapping into that we're missing. Um, and I think that that would be the role of this committee to bring to the board if that were lacking. And the only way that we're going to find that out is by doing it. Great. Uh, last a formal question is what information do you think the committee will need to complete their work and how would you approach getting that information? Absolutely. I think there is a treasure trove of information out there. And I think right now, probably a lot of us both on this topic and everything else are an information overload. Um, so I think that you just need to figure out a way to aggregate all of the information that you're getting, understand that it has been fact checked, that it's um, correct, that it is um, something that you can feel safe about sharing with the community. Um, and so I think What's most important, to be totally frank, is trainings, I think, both for this board, um, for uh, the school committee. Um, and I think that that is really the first step um, in increasing everybody's inclusion, equity, and belonging literacy so that we can start with a foundation of leadership and leading by example. Um, you know, my aunt told me it's probably a good thing that I don't know how to golf and I'm not 
somebody who gets on the links and tries it out. Um, she's like, you should just wait to talk to a pro because you don't want to pick up any bad habits. Um, and I know that it's, it's hard because I think everybody is um, out worried to make mistakes. And um, that's a really human thing to do is make mistakes. And I think that, um, you know, this committee is here to help cushion some of those mistakes and turn them into something productive and um, a learning experience. And so I think that the only way we can start to do that is through training. Um, like I said, to get your feet on the ground and actually experience um, actively anti-racist work. Great. Thank you so much. I will um, open it to the board if there are any follow-up questions that you'd like to direct to Ms. Aducci. Is I, I hope I say that right. Yes, you are. <laughs> well done. Uh, does the board? Okay. Um, being brief does not mean disinterest or that you didn't have a lot of important things to say. I'll say this to everyone. It's in the interest of making sure that Tony doesn't ring the gong on us and we can get through this um, meeting. Um, Actually, I'm going to ask a quick question, if you don't mind. Sure. So, uh, Nicole, you're, and, and people haven't seen your resume here, so your resume is very impressive in terms of the work that you do in this field. Uh, you're, you're a consultant and you've worked, you've worked gathering groups together and venting this out, so... It's very appropriate. One thing I will note is that you don't live in Situate now. Yes. Um, so um, I don't know. It's not a great thing, but I don't know. If it's a it's a terrible bad thing either. Your 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 skill set is is extremely impressive. Um, so I just want to make sure that yeah. everyone's aware of that you live in South Boston now, but you were born. You just tell me a little bit about, about yeah, your connection to exactly. Situate. Born and raised in Situate. I'm actually here right now at my folks' house. My folks still live in Situate on Cedar Crest Lane. Um, and so I'm here several times a week. Um, I live and work in South Boston um, in 385 square feet. So I do really love coming home where I live like a clean <laughs> and stable floors and a set of stairs. It's really amazing. But um, so I am home quite a bit. And to be totally honest with you, I think there's something to be said for a little bit of physical and emotional distance sometimes. Um, I think there's something to be said for not getting caught up in the day-to-day -day minutia. Um, I know everything right now is extremely intense, both in and out of Situate, um, and it's hard to deny that. And so I think that there um, really is something to be said for being able to take some physical and mental and emotional distance um, from any topic. Uh, to tell, but to uh, what I want you, if you can, Tell me your connection to Situate oh, so absolutely. that you can build a case for yourself. Yeah, totally. Being, yeah. yeah. So you went to high school here, you yeah, grew up here. here. I graduated from Situate in 2010. Um, I, you know, I live here. I love, I, 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 I still feel like I live here. I'm here, you know, most of the week, especially since the pandemic set in. It's nice to be able to stretch my legs. I take my dog to the AJ McEachern Park all the time. Um, I wake up every day and I go down for my Lucky Finn's coffee. My last meal on earth would be a stuffed shrimp plate from Situate Tavern with a side of mashed potatoes and their carrots. Okay. Um, <laughs> I am a Situate girl through and through. Um, I'm extremely passionate about this community. Um, I was a theater kid growing up, so that's probably why um, I'm super loud and um, you may recognize me from some of the Situate High School theater productions um, from the past, but it's, the community is really important to me. Um, it's my safe haven. Um, it's somewhere that I retreat to um, when the city is getting too, you know, intense or to anything. It's my home. Um, so... No more. Uh, You've said I enough. really You've, want you to be it. able to invest back into the community that I grew up in and that I love. Great. Great. Thank you. Any other questions from the board for Ms. Atucci? All right. Thank you so much. Um, our next applicant is Elaine Mongazon. I, oh, I've known you long That's enough. Okay. I shouldn't do you this, know, but you I say your name and address. That's okay. Um, you know, I didn't want to blow up the meeting, but I, I, Applied thinking, you might need applicants, but I realized tonight you've got a lot of applicants. So seeing as you don't need people, I just assume rescind. Um, I only did it thinking, well, I, I feel strongly about it. And I, I think it's a great idea to have the committee. And I was hoping to add to it, but you have so many people um, and probably, well, obviously, by Nicole's well-qualified, okay? So 
I'm going to take my name out of the hat. <laughs> All right. Well, Elaine, we really appreciate you raising your hand in the first place. And I think it speaks to what I said earlier about the community gets this, that this is important. And it is. And I'll be standing member. And I appreciate you uh, participating. Okay. Thank That's you. I just did not want to not show up. All right. We just got okay. an extra couple of minutes, Mr. Vignani. <laughs> um, our next would be Ms. Burke. Stephanie, there you are. Hi. Oh, wait, I, I went backwards and I unmuted you. Sorry, Seth was ahead of me. Okay, there you are. Stephanie Burke, if you could give your name and address for the record and we'll ask you our questions. Okay, my name is Stephanie Burke. I live at 93 Marion Road. Great, uh, well, the first question is, um, the charge specifically works to eradicate oppression, justice, racism, and violence in our community. Why do you think this work is important? Um, well, I think it's important right now in the current climate, especially because I feel like we need to do everything we can possible to make our citizens feel safe and especially our children. So I feel like there needs to be um, a proactive approach instead of reactionary approach. I think there's that symbol that you were all speaking about. Um, I think that's important to our youth. Um, but more importantly, I look at things um, now. I look at legislation, I look at bills, I look at policy, and I look at things in terms of if this was a building in 1920, and I'm not talking about August 18th, 1920, I'm thinking January 1st, 1920, would everyone be able to enter this building equally? Would everyone have a fair opportunity to enter this building? Would this building be there? So do these policies does everyone have a fair shot at all these policies, at, at these practices? And that's what I try to look at. LGBTQIA+, um, people who are neurodiverse, people living with physical disabilities, and then people of color. And so I think it's important to take that eye and realize that we're not that far off from 100 years ago. There are still a lot of things in play where people cannot enter as much as freely as we'd like to think they can. And that's why I think looking at everything and breaking it down in terms of that is very important. Okay. And what skills and experience would you bring to make this work, the goals, meet the goals? So um, growing up, um, I actually grew up in California. So I think that, um, sorry, I just got my battery, <laughs> low battery, hold on right here. <laughs> um, Growing up in California, I feel like I have a different perspective than a lot of people who are maybe from here or grew up in Massachusetts. Um, I've lived in California um, for a long life. I lived in Italy. Um, I went to school in Santa Barbara, uh, UC Santa Barbara, which was um, very, um, it's very well known for its adaption of Chicano studies and other cultural studies and turning those from minors and in studies into majors. Um, additionally, into so I, I think I have a experience of just being around where a lot of practices and policies are in place just because of the diversity of the people within those places. Um, I also spent summers attending and then eventually working at um, camps that worked with inner city youth um, and at kids from at-risk communities. Um, and in these places, we had a lot of you know, very close intimate moments where people shared stories and shared um, ideals. And it was there I learned that mostly that, you know, we could look at the same thing, but from two different perspectives, that they might well, these might as well be oceans apart. And um, I learned a lot through that. Additionally, I'm a business owner. Um, so being a business owner, you are constantly looking out for ways that somebody is going to attack one of your policies or something you've done or in a way you've acted. So being very well of what's happening and making sure um, things are inclusive. And then I've also um, done the human resources for all of our businesses. <coughs> I've taken courses and, and studied that as well, um, doing our handbooks and those kinds of things, so. Great, thank you, Stephanie. And uh, we've, um, we've proposed a, 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 a composition of the committee and I wondered if you thought that composition was appropriate to meet the goals as proposed. Well, I would say that if we look at all the applicants individually and we look at their resumes and see that people are perhaps, um, you know, I know that we have some applicants who are lawyers. I know that we have some applicants who have human resources experiences. So I think at the risk of um, sacrificing 
perhaps a person of color like myself who does have human resource experiences would then direct things. And then obviously I wouldn't make the final decision. We would then take this and ask a human resource person to step in. And, and this is how we read this. How would you in your experience in working with this town read this? And then having a person of color who is perhaps, you know, a lawyer or offers one of the other uh, skill sets that you think is necessary to this. I don't think that a person from the town should take the place or of a person of color personally. Um, I also don't think that if the people didn't apply or haven't been active in this process, I don't feel like there's a lot of passion. I mean, you've met a lot of passionate people on this meeting alone. So I think passion and dedication and urgency is key in this. There are people who have given up a lot of their time. Um, you can see me, I'm at work right now. I've given up a lot of time with my children to make this uh, an important topic, to make this a priority for me. Um, and, and I find that there's a lot of people that share that passion. So I think that should be taken into consideration when looking at the people who are applying versus the people who have been suggested to this board. Okay, thank you. And um, what information do you think the committee will need to gather and how would you approach obtaining that information? So I think the committee, um, a lot of the information is out there already as far as looking at budgets and salaries and information and such. I also think we need to look at past hiring practices when it comes to contracts that we've given out via the town. Um, we also look at, need to look at language for job ads that are being put out there. Uh, we need to look at events. We need to look at permits that are being requested for events and making sure the events are open and welcoming to all. Um, I think there's a lot of information and a lot of transparency. Um, basically, I feel like anything that gets put in front of the town should be, should this committee should have access to because it's important to be able to value it. And if not to make decisions, just to more ask questions to the board. Hey, here's something we hope you look at. Here's something we hope you consider because as we've all acknowledged, this is a learning process for a lot of people. Um, I myself, growing up in a certain, you know, in, in a family that is very diverse and growing up in an area that's very diverse, I can look in a room and if I, if I see that it's all particularly one race, I, I, it makes me uncomfortable. I'm just like, where's the representation? It's very natural for me to wonder, to look for diversity, to feel more comfortable in a diverse place to make sure everyone is feeling welcome. That's just because of how I was raised and where I'm from. I understand that that's not the way for everybody and that people don't have a room or have a bunch of posters up and question what's in front of them it's it's and i understand that but i think there are people that do have that and that's important to recognize that maybe you're looking at something one way and you think you see something but let's present it to this group and see if we're missing something because i really do look at this as a partnership great thank you so much stephanie i will um see if there are any follow-up questions from them members of the board Miss um, Curran. Hi, thanks, Stephanie. Um, great responses. I just want to say before we go on to more applicants, too, that I view this committee as really looking at a lot of our policies and practices and coming back and outlining areas in which we need to take a look and make changes. So I just want to make sure that that's your understanding as well. Um, so we're just, it's, it's, it's more than just a, you know, for lack of a better word, philosophical oversight, right? We want to make, have like real tangible outcomes from this committee. So I just want to make sure that that's clear too. Is there something that I said that, that is a question? Or? No, just, no, no, just, I, you know, just listening to both, you know, both um, candidates. I just want to make sure that everyone understands it's a pretty tactic, you know, a tactical committee that we're looking to go into and say, okay, we ask, you know, is what kind of training happens today? Well, let's add X amount of training or whatever so that there's a review and a recommendation as well. Does that make sense? Yes, I yeah. do. I think Thank that, that I, would, I would hate for the committee to be limited. I would hate, I would hope that there's the yeah. policies and the looking out of it and then perhaps we see something else that is presented um, and looking at it and, and to open the eyes and this can be a starting point is how I see it. And if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm happy to back out, but I think it's a starting point as is the whole anti-racist um, 
you know, I don't know if you want to call it a movement, but a, being an anti-racist is, is about a starting point. And I, I think this is a great starting point and I understand the charge, but I'm hoping that it can continue and maybe we look for other additional ways to grow and that can be presented to the board via absolutely. the advisory. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mara. That was exactly the sort of point I wanted to make when I made my introductory comments about that this is an advisory board that we want exactly as Ms. Kern said. I think the comment that, that caught my ear and, it, and might have caused Ms. Um, Kern to say this is, is you mentioned sort of having this group, which is outside of our scope, but having this group being eyes and ears to um, um, review things that in the lens of this committee. And I could almost see that as a recommendation of the board is to say, let's not end this in 12 months. You know, that's, that, I think that's, it's the difference in what we're looking for now is we need to just inventory our work, fix what we can, identify where it can be, um, and then look to the very qualified people who are coming on this committee to come up with ideas like that, that we're not even thinking about yet. So um, yes, no, thank you. Stephanie has been very instrumental in helping us think through some of these things. So I thank you for your work um, already. And um, is, are there any other questions from our board? Mr. Vignani? Yeah, just one quick question. We're, we're at 10 minutes. So um, <laughs> in, Stephanie, in like 30 seconds, can you just give me a little bit of your connection to Situate? How long have you lived here? What's your business? What's your interaction here in terms of how you would understand the town? Um, so I live in Situate. I moved here permanently in 2018. We bought a house in 2014. I went back and forth because I still own businesses in California and I was able to work hard, play hard because I only own bars in California. I didn't have the duty of the restaurant. Um, here I own a restaurant in Cohasset um, and, and my connection to Situate is it took me a long time to accept Situate for what it was. It was hard for me to be here at first. Um, being a woman of color, growing up in a diverse environment and not feeling comfortable. Um, and I left that I would be honest, that is part of why I left at first. And, and then I came back because I say the veil had been lifted. I'd seen the lemonade stands and the bridge dance, jumping and all that. And Situate is an amazing place and it's a very special place and I love it. And I wanted to raise my kids here. I think there are really great people here. I think there are really good people who realize they're, they're, this town is not as welcoming as it can be. And I and I'm and I'm here for that. I'm here to see how I how, how can I help the board with this mission. How can I you know join that? And I and I want to be a part of it. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, at the risk of going over time, anyone else have a question for Ms. Burke? Seeing none. Thank no, but you. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Stephanie. And um, great. Okay, so we will go on to. Connor Jordy is our is our next alphabetical. Uh, Connor is here. Um, Seth, the magic man, will unmute you. Uh, Connor has also apl he's applied for this committee. He's also applied for the cultural council. Um, so thank you for your interest in the community. Would you please state your name and address, and we'll get started. Sure, Connor Doherty at six hundred three Country Way. Um, and just right off the bat, I'd also like to introduce myself with um, some social identifiers that not everyone gets the ability to hide based on their physical appearance. So I am white, straight, cisgender, married, able-bodied male. I'm a father to two biological children, um, and I am both food and housing secure. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Doherty. Um, the uh, charge specifically um, specifies that we work to eradicate oppression, racism, injustice, violence um, against everyone in our community. Why do you think this work is important? Um, because I see it in the community in a way I think that some other people don't. Um, I'm the son of an immigrant and I never get the kind of commentary that someone like Steph might get because of the color of her skin or the kind of business she owns or her ethnic background. No one has ever asked me where I'm from. Um, two weeks after we bought our house in Situate, someone who was here working on the house for us, I was just kind of making small talk with him and uh, complained about like, man, Situate seems great, but it's like, you got to drive 20 minutes to get anywhere. And he said, yeah, at least there's no F and N words though. Am I right? Um, 
And that was the first time that I heard the M word in situate and it's been said around me multiple times since. Um, so because I'm a white Irish Catholic straight male who can talk about the pats and socks and stuff, I feel like people let their guard down and I see something in our community that some other people know is there, but they don't see in the same way. What ex specific experience and skills do you have that you think the committee will help to meet the goals? Um, so I don't have quite the incredible uh, resume that our, our first applicant, I think it was Nicole. Um, mine is less formal. Um, you know, through my friends, um, my roommate in college was also a first generation American, but his parents were from India. I learned a lot from him. Uh, my first black girlfriend was in college. I learned a lot from her. Uh, one of my close friends revised his charter language for the UN uh, to be people first. So she taught me how saying disabled people really matters and is very different than saying people with disabilities. And that was something that took me a long time to learn and come around to. Um, but now I'm a huge advocate for and believer in. Uh, my wife, when we lived in New York, uh, taught in Brooklyn in one of the worst areas that still exists there. Her school get closed probably three times a year for gunshots on the block. Um, she had students who came to the classroom from homeless shelters, which as someone who grew up in framing or sorry, Sherborne, I didn't even know that was a thing. Like didn't even occur to my brain that kids could be homeless and still go to a public school. Um, and through her work, both there and then in Mattapan, when we moved back to Massachusetts, um, we both learned a lot, but uh, it was just this journey through her professional development, reading the books, uh, having the conversations with people in her schools and people in my life um, that has just grown an awareness in me over the years. It's taken me many, many years to get to where I am. Um, so it's not an official resume. It's just a, a life experience resume. Great. Thank you for sharing. Um, the, the charge recommends uh, certain committees may be, uh, certain members may be on the committee. Uh, what do you think about the proposed uh, composition of the committee? And do you think it's appropriate to meet the goals? Um, like others have said, I think it's hard to say. We're, we're building the plane that we're flying, kind of, <laughs> right? So I feel like, um, to me, as it is now, it's a great starting place. And it might change, it might not. And I feel like that's the kind of thing this committee needs to be open to is, as we're doing it, as we're running it, maybe we'll realize we have a blind spot or uh, there's something we've over, overlooked. But as it is now, I think it's a great, great place to begin. Okay. And uh, the last is what information do you think the committee will need to gather, do the work, and how would you approach that information? Um, the information that we need to gather would be all. <laughs> Uh, I feel like it's just so broad. Um, it could be written statements. It could be informal hearsay. It could be interviews with people. If we're trying to get, you know, an active initial policy and things that we have in writing that's got opportunity for improvement, that's an easy place to start. It's, it's in writing. But then we might want to grow beyond that and say, okay, but what about hearsay? What about people's personal experiences and stories? Like that might be something we're going to look at further down the line once we've gone through a more tactical approach of looking at written policy, written procedures, hiring practices, vendor, you know, hiring practices and all that. I could see it becoming a less formal, more interview-based uh, approach down the line if we're really looking to eradicate uh, this problem. Okay, great. Thank you, Connor. Um, does the board have any follow-up questions that I'd like to ask Mr. Doherty? I don't have everybody on my screen. I'll just, I'll just ask Caller, them. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, just again, if you can just elaborate what your connection is with Situate, how long you've been here, what you're doing, and where you may have potentially seen any of, uh, you know, any of social injustice stuff that we're trying to identify. Um, sure. So my connection, I first came here when I was 17. Uh, I went to St. Sebastian's in Needham and my best friend, we were in the same boat on the sailing team, uh, grew up in Situate. So I got to come here in high school to like hang out at his house and fell in love with it. I was like, oh my God, it's like Cape Cod, but I don't have to like <laughs> drive as far from my parents' house to get there. Um, so my wife and I bought here uh, two and a half years ago. 
Uh, we live in town. I fell in love with it when I first came down to look at the house that we live in now. Driving around, I saw, you know, kids walking with pails and fishing rods without any parents around. I'd see kids playing in playgrounds with no uh, parents, just, you know, riding bikes around town. And, you know, we lived in Brooklyn for years before that and briefly in Milton where, you know, the idea of like two kids who don't know each other interacting on a playground without a parent running over and intervening was crazy. So to see that like, I don't know, the Americana of the Norman Rockwell Saturday Evening Post cover like still exists and is real in some places was amazing. And I just fell in love with that aspect of the town right away. Um, where do I see it still? I mean, I see it constantly. I would even say, um, I hate to put you on the spot, but I feel like this is part of the work. More, your statement right before we got started was problematic to me. Um, that you would feel the need to say, based on the events of this past weekend, I hope everyone on this call conducts themselves with respect. Uh, I think we need to look past grouping people in collectivism based on preconceived notions or actions of other people and instead focus on the individual. No one on this call was engaged in anything inappropriate over the weekend. And just because a few individuals may have done something bad in an event of 180 or more people, I, I don't understand what would make you think you need to set the tone for a call uh, based on the actions of other people. So it's that kind of thinking, individualism versus collectivism. I see it all the time in town. Collectivism applied to white people uh, when it's something positive. Collectivism applied to people of color and their advocates when it's something negative. Individualism applied to white people when it's negative. Individualism applied to people of color and their advocates when it's positive. I, I don't have to stand up for Ms. Curran, but um, all she was doing was trying to, to set the, I mean, you've, you've probably been to selectmen's meetings and seen where <laughs> things can go. No, she no, was no, just, no, let no, me no. finish, let me finish, let me finish, yeah. let me finish. So she was just trying to set the path for a productive meeting, certainly wasn't going anywhere other than that. So uh, I, think, I think you might've misread that a little bit, but thank you for your feedback. I appreciate that and I, I appreciate that and I thank you for saying that. And please don't think that I misinterpreted her intentions as anything but positive. Um, it's just the difficult work of us having to look in and say, why did I feel the need to do that? Would I have done that if this was the shellfish committee and two shell fishermen had gotten in a fight at TK O'Malley's last night? Would I say, hey guys, I know you weren't at TK O'Malley's, but can we all conduct ourselves? It's just a question, a hypothetical, and it's a way we've all been taught to think and behave because we all grew up in America. And it's something that we have to teach ourselves to become aware of and try to overcome. Um, I catch myself doing it still to this day and I have to overcome it too. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Goodrich, are you? Yes, yeah, so I, I just had a question. So what um, specific town uh, committees or policies are you, are you most interested in, in to, to looking at? Uh, for me, I think we have the most growth to do as a town culturally and in our education system. I know there is a separate school DEI committee, so maybe we're a little more limited there. But those are areas that I see really huge room for growth in. Um, that's specifically with racial justice. Just when I talk with um, like Eric Sullivan, I don't know if you guys know him, he, uh, he's confined to a wheelchair. And when I talk to him about his experience in town and beach access compared to the towns where he spends time in, in Florida half the year, Situate has a lot of work to do there. Um, there's a tremendous amount of work to be done in our public art. If you go around town, the representation there is strictly white people anytime there's public art that shows people in it. And they're all able-bodied and they're all heteronormative. So <laughs> there's opportunity everywhere. I mean, I could take up the rest of the Zoom call, but um, there's just there's so much to be done. And it's the kind of stuff that I think having lived outside of Situate, having lived in really diverse communities, when I first came here, I was able to see this stuff. And when I point it out to people, they say, oh, you know what, I never noticed that. I've seen that every day and I've never noticed it. Um, so I'm trying to bring that fresh set of eyes and hope to identify some of this stuff. Great. Uh, thank you, Connor. Are there other? Wait. Okay, um, then we will move on to Kim Kelly Harriman, who is a box somewhere. Seth, are you unmuting? She's there, she's there. She's there. Okay, um, Kim, 
Oh, there you are. You're the yes, little person down there. Hi. <laughs> Uh, we met you early, but would you just restate your name and address, please? Sure. Kim Kelly Harriman, 40 Driftway. Thank you. Um, so yeah. your first question, as, as everyone, is uh, the charge specifically uh, specifies working to eradicate oppression, racism, injustice, and violence in our community. Why do you think this work is important? I, I think this work has always been important. I think the tragedy is that it even needs to be done. I think racism is a socially constructed concept. And um, I think we as white people have a responsibility um, to do what we can to dismantle it. Um, I think this work is hundreds of years um, late in coming. Um, so I hope to be a part of it in some way. Thank you. And what particular experiences and skills do you bring that would help meet the goals? Um, you know, one of the skills that first comes to mind, I don't know if it's a skill, it's a quality, is that I'm willing to be challenged. And I think that anybody doing this work needs to be willing to be challenged. And I have been challenged over and over again by students. Um, I am a social worker, so um, just by definition, I have an obligation by my code of ethics to engage in anti-racist practice and to be an advocate for all marginalized groups. I'm also on the faculty at the Graduate School of Social Work at Simmons University and um, have been, this is my eighth year, and I can say that I've learned so much from our students. I'm sure I've learned more from them than they have learned from me. Um, and um, I have spent really these years um, dealing with the issue of racism um, in our school. It is our first priority. I just, as I mentioned earlier, was part of drafting a statement for our school in, in terms of how we will engage in anti-racist practice. I, um, in addition to my teaching responsibilities, I'm the director of our internship program at the, um, at the university. And as such, I have um, had many too many opportunities um, to intervene when students are experiencing um, outright racism or microaggressions in their field placements. I've had to go in as a mediator and either help remediate the situation or pull the student from the situation. Um, I've created on my team, uh, my department of 10 people full time, um, a culture whereby we have accountability partners. We challenge each other when we um, hear any sort of microaggression, whether it be around race or gender or any other, um, again, any other marginalized group. Um, and we do hold each other accountable. We had such a meeting today. Um, so, um, so this is in my lifeblood several years ago when Ferguson happened. I, um, I'm also the editor of our professional journal at the university and I went to a faculty member who I greatly admire and who is a friend who is an African American man and I said, Gary, I need to write something in the editorial about Ferguson, but who am I as a white woman of privilege? And he said, Kim, if not you, then who? And that phrase has stuck with me since, and I feel my intense obligation to do something. I have wanted to get more involved with my town for years, but raising children and one with special needs and working full time has precluded my ability. When I saw this come up, I said, this is my um, opportunity. This is the one I'd like to jump on board with. Great, thank you. Um, the charge we did um, put out recommended useful, what we thought would be useful committee members. Uh, do you think the composition is appropriate to meet these goals? I'm going to have to hijack the responses of my, um, <laughs> pre the previous applicants who I've thoroughly enjoyed, by the way, um, and say that I think it's, um, I, I like the expression, uh, we're building the plane that we're going to fly. I think it sort of remains to be seen, and I think the intentions are all good. And, um, and I think this, it's a wonderful place to start, is my sense. Um, and who am I to know, for sure. Um, and you, you've already alluded to some of the experience you've had in this final question, but um, what kind of information do you think that this committee is going to need to gather, and how are you going to go about doing that? I, well, I think first to get some sort of committee consensus about where we start. And I would think that in addition to some policy issues and, and perhaps talking to our public servants as one primary group, whether they be school officials, um, teachers, um, our safety um, professionals, um, to get their input. Um, and I think that, that some gathering of some oral history, talking to our residents who are people of color, 
and understanding their experience. Whenever I want to understand why a group of students are complaining, um, I walk right into it and I meet with them and ask them, um, what can we do better? And that, um, that is where I think we need to start is to find out what is your experience. Um, the, I've learned in uh, very profound ways how the tentacles of racism just are intertwined in everything we do in conversations. And, um, and it has really, some of my observations of it firsthand have really shifted my inner world. Great, thank you so much, Kim. Um, are there, thank does you. the board member have any follow-up questions? For, for Excuse me, I'm answering to a dog who wants to come in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does the board have any, Mr. Goodrich? Yes, yeah, so I, I I love looking at, at your background, and it seems like you have uh, some of a, of a healthcare background. I think I asked the other gentleman about some areas, and one area I'm very concerned about is the area of public health, and and the and the um, seeing it through the lens of uh, diversity issues with our board of health and everything. Just it's, it's an area I don't know always gets the attention, and with your your background uh, in healthcare, can you speak to that at all or uh, how that? Sure, it's a great question. And, and, and of course, COVID-19 has exposed um, uh, inequities in a way that perhaps nothing has, else has recently um, in terms of the lack of access to care for people of color and certainly the class issues. Um, I, I, I was actually, I've been involved in a committee that involves um, directors of social work in the teaching hospitals in Boston and directors of field education, which is my current role. And, um, and the, the purpose of the committee has actually been to challenge the hospitals on the interns that they accept um, for training, because we were noticing a pattern of, um, of interns being accepted were all white and came from elitist privileged backgrounds. And we challenged them to think more broadly about representation for the people that they're serving. And this has started some really rich conversations um, across um, between hospitals and schools. And it has been, again, we've, we've created a safe community together in our committee to challenge each other. Um, and of course that's graduate students, but the bigger conversation is, um, is just healthcare in general public health, um, what, what is it that we need to do um, to really achieve equity in those areas? I, I hope that answers your question yeah, no, that, a little thank bit. You. Sure. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, any other follow-up questions from members of the board? Uh, I, yeah. If I could just repeat my, my current theme on the prior ones. Um, Kim, can you just tell me about a little bit about your your um, interactions in situate and where you may have witnessed or, or just seen some sort of or just what you've been involved in what's your connection to situate and where where this may have been prevalent for you um, um, well I, I've lived in situate for more than 25 years um, I um, I see this all the time. I can't necessarily say in situate because my world in situate is very white. I grew mm -hmm. up in Brockton um, and, um, and it's really interesting. I think back now, I, I love this community and I don't ever want to be anywhere else, but I, I do wonder looking back is, was this the best place to raise children in terms of really showing them what the world is? Um, and it, you know, the, the one thing, I don't know if this really answers your question, but I was really stopped in my tracks and I, I shared this story, um, this morning with one of my colleagues when um, my daughter at a very early age um, started to notice um, the patterns of where people of color live in this town and um, asked questions. She was being thoughtful about it, but she said, I don't understand um, why this person lives in this neighborhood. And, um, and, and so it just, it really begins to get your thinking going about how this, this exists everywhere, even in our lovely community, the, the structures in our culture have, have divided us and have not given people of color the opportunities that they need. So, um, so I see it in some of the class differences and um, there's such intersection with class and race because of the opportunities that have not been there. Hmm. Um, so I don't know, again, if that answers the question. Yeah, I don't it does. I, you know, I, 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 I guess you certainly have the background and the experience in, in, in the area we're discussing. Um, 
so I, I think I think you'd be a good candidate. I'm also trying to find people that have experienced it, you know, to get on the committee as well. So I'm, that's that's kind of why I'm probing in that area. Sure, um, and I think that's where you're going to find. I mean, yeah. you know, people of color themselves are going to have the stories right. to share. Yeah, right. And but some other people have too. I mean, oh, like like you just said, you've witnessed it. It does. It didn't necessarily have to happen to you, but you may have been involved in a church thing or this thing where you saw where you had yeah. just interaction. So I, yeah. I thank you. You did answer the question. And having raised a child who's different. Um, you know, neurodevelopmentally different, I can say that I um, witnessed firsthand. Right, that, that's um, a very, very good point. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. A, a very big pain point, and yet I don't in any way intend to compare it to racism. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course, thank you. Um, any other questions from the board? Thank you so much for, um, for your comments. Um, I am proposing that I, I hand over the questioning to one of my colleagues so that you don't get tired of hearing my voice. And I think Ms. Curran has um, been volunteered. <laughs> um, so I was hoping that you, if you wouldn't mind, you could start our next um, applicant is Celia. And I hope I say this right, Rika or Risha? Risha. Risha, all right, I had a 50 You're close. Okay, um, I will turn you to the capable hands of my colleague, Ms. Curran. Thank you, Karen, and welcome, Celia. Sorry, I was hoping you were gonna keep the order, Karen, so good, because I don't have, have yeah. your, your list in front of me. So, um, Celia, thank you so much for coming um, in front of us this evening. And um, so the first question is uh, for everybody, the charge uh, specifies working to eradicate oppression racism and justice and violence against the people in our community. What do you think, um, why do you think that this work is important? Sure, and I didn't state my address to start. It's 30 Oh, I'm sorry, Celia. Okay. Yep. Uh, 30, 32 Lawson Road. Um, and I would just echo what has said before, it's been important for centuries now. And I think, you know, with the charge of this committee, it's, there's some urgency involved. I think people of color are tired is I think the key word in 2020 that we're still dealing with these issues. Um, so there's urgency there. I would say the importance is we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think the fourth pillar is belonging. And unless you feel like you belong in a community or you can belong at work and bring your full self, you're not going to contribute. And when you think about societal and economic impacts of that, I mean, they're grave. But, huh? That's where the wealth gap comes in between especially Black and Latinx communities and other communities of color and white families, right? So that sense of belonging and not being able for kids not feeling like they can be themselves at school, that means they can't learn as well as their white peers. Um, similarly with anybody working within, you know, the situate town structure, if they feel like they can't <coughs> act how they want to act or bring their full selves to work. So the, it's a ripple effect. Great point. Um, okay, what experience or skills do you bring to the committee that will help meet the goals of the charge? And I, I think, you know, I'll head off Mr. Vignani and maybe do the, the skills. You can uh, give us a little bit of, you know, what brought you here, how long you've been in it and whatnot in your experience. Sure. So I'm a first generation woman of color. I grew up actually in Boston, um, moved to DC for a while, and I've been in Situate, bought a house here about five years ago with my husband. Um, I, it took, I would say I hadn't heard of Situate before um, being in Boston until I moved here. And I was hesitant to move here. Uh, I think the numbers and what you can't hide is the diversity, right? Because you see it. Um, and I didn't know if I wanted to raise my now son in a town where he would be one of a few people of color or a different ethnic background. I think that is a challenge for us. Um, and I think it's a detriment in terms of attracting um, residents to the town and I don't want Situate to fall in that um, trap because there is so many positive things going for it um, and I do think we need different perspectives um, in the town and I know that's been said before. In terms of my work and background it's in human rights and advocacy. I, I started off with the Human Rights Committee in the House of Representatives um, focused mostly on issues of gender-based violence um, working with UN partners um, now I lead work for the business community at the Chamber of Commerce. I head up our economic opportunity work, um, focused again on closing the wealth gap, um, racial wealth gap in the state. I think some of the skills there are working with uh, diverse coalitions of both people and businesses. I think something integral to this committee is not everyone is at the same 
starting point with their understanding or learning and they're all starting this journey differently and you're going to have to meet people where they are different town uh, offices and departments are going to be in different places and not going to move at the same place or be resistant to the work so i think it's going to take that great deal of patience and someone who knows how to manage diverse stakeholders um, with also you know systemic issues baked into policy i think we have to be intentional in this work um, a lot of people have said anti-racist i think that comes from being intentional i don't think anybody has been intentionally racist but by not actively being against it, it's there. And now we're, you know, living with the repercussions, unfortunately. So I would say in, sh in short, that's the, the skill set. Okay, thank you. And then the charge recommends members which may be useful to the committee. Do you think the proposed composition of the committee is appropriate to meet the goals? Uh, I would say the one missing piece, I think um, Andrew actually hit this on the head, it's the public health piece. If the charge of the committee, at least initially, is for a 12-month period, the pandemic is not going anywhere before next summer, at least. Mm -hmm. um, and with the health and health care disparities um, disproportionately affecting people of color, um, you need that perspective, whether with one of the at-large um, members of the community or somebody from the Situate Board of Public Health. Um, you have public safety. I think public health is the other key piece that we need. Either that or someone in social work, which I know there are other candidates here with that background, but I think one of the two is integral. That's a great point. And then uh, what information do you think uh, the committee will need to gather to complete their work and how would you approach obtaining that information? Sure, I think uh, most of it is a matter of public record. I think what we need to get at is incentivizing the work too, right? Because we can't only use um, sticks. And so, you know, for me, I think one of the things I focus now on in my work is supplier diversity and purchasing. And so looking at the town, like what is going out to bid, how far in advance, because that is work, like right now we need to have action items that are fast because people are tired of waiting. But purchasing takes forever. Contracts can last five, 10 years with one vendor. And so what's coming down the pipeline, that sort of information that we need that may not be available now, but that we can anticipate by asking people. Um, I think that's some things that we, we need information in advance if we're gonna affect change faster. And I don't know if that's a matter of public record quite yet. No, I agree with you. I think that's definitely one of the, the, the first orders of business you know, is to obtain a lot of that information. Um, okay, um, any other follow-up questions by my fellow members? No, uh, Karen, Kay, I'll you ask you a quick one. Tony, go ahead. Yeah, I, and it's really just a note uh, and a question. Did you actually, uh, were you a member on, on a committee very similar to this in Virginia? Oh, no. So right now, as a part of my day job, um, I sit on um, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee for the Association of Chambers of Commerce. So it's as I sit on my Chamber of Commerce, but we help advise the members of chambers across the country on what they can do um, proactively. As you can imagine, Boston and Massachusetts is more progressive than other states. So we often share best practices and learnings on what they could potentially do with the business community. But it's specifically in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yes. Great. Thank you. And for clarification, you're on the Boston Chamber of Commerce, correct? Yes, Greater Boston. Greater Boston. Okay. Great. Great resume. Uh, Anyone else? Andrew, Karen, Karen? No. Good. Well, thanks, uh, Cecilia. Um, you know, great resume, great. Uh, Everyone that's come to the audio, just as Kim had said earlier, we have a lot of great candidates. So oh, thank you for coming forward and for talking to us. Um, our next um, uh, applicant is Randy Robertson. I want to say come on down, but that might. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for having me tonight. Uh, one of the bad things about being towards the end of the alphabet is I got a lot of hard acts to follow. <laughs> My name is Randy Roberts and I live at 71 First Parish Road. Hi Randy, thank you for coming in. Um, so the charge specifies that um, working to eradicate oppression, racism, injustice, and violence against all people in our community. Why do you think that this work is important here in Situate? Well, as you can probably tell, I'm not originally from Situate. 
uh, but I've been a resident here for about eight years now. Uh, I've moved around a lot because of my job. I've lived in a number of communities across the United States and overseas. Uh, before moving here, I actually town shop for about two years uh, here in New England, looking for the perfect community. Uh, and I finally made, decided to make Situate my home. I'm unmuted. You gotta turn it on. I'm muted? No, nope, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, having lived in a number of communities uh, all over the nation, I've seen firsthand how racism and other forms of discrimination that you mentioned uh, can absolutely destroy a community. I've seen it divide friendships, uh, the workplace, and really just uh, tearing, torn down a community. And I feel very strongly that a diverse community that's uh, free of any kind of social injustice is what makes us a strong community. Uh, I'm looking forward to working together to eliminate any of these forms of social injustice here in the town. And I, I want to try to make this town the perfect town that I decided to move in and make my own. Thank you. And, and what experience or skills do you bring to the committee that will help meet the goals of the charge? Well, part of my, my real job is uh, I develop a lot of policies and procedures for uh, how to govern a workplace and, and small communities. Uh, I've got uh, some training in diversity and inclusion. Uh, there's a lot of training in eradication uh, and elimination discrimination from the workplace. And I think one of the more important things I bring is an outside objective viewpoint uh, to try to bring a fresh perspective to this committee. Uh, somebody mentioned I, I would like to bring some actionable recommendations for our town to adopt for procedures and policies to help us eliminate even a perception of racism. I, I do think that, that we have a problem, but I just want to eliminate even the perception of any racism and injustice. And like I said, I've seen how damage it can be to a community. And it's one of my passions to try to make sure we eliminate this in situ. Thank you. Um, and then the charge recommends members, which may be useful to the committee. Do you think that the proposed composition of the committee is appropriate to meet those goals? You know, when I was first reading the job ad, uh, when I saw it posted on Facebook uh, a couple of months ago, I started thinking through my head as I was reading through it, how, who I would put on this committee. And when I got down to the bottom of it and I saw who you guys had already selected, I was actually amazed that that was a very diverse uh, set of backgrounds to put on it. So I don't see anybody. I would like to reserve the option to uh, uh, recall some subject matter experts as the committee explores and, and decides where where some problems might exist or where we want to look into. We might need to call in some subject matter experts to advise the committee. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I think the committee uh, looks pretty well so far. Okay. And then what information do you think the committee will need to gather to complete their work and how would you go about obtaining that information, Randy? Well, as others have said, I think we've got a lot of the policies and procedures in the town. I'd like to look into the HR perspective, some of the human resources perspectives, uh, and also try to gather some, not only some facts, but some perceptions from around town uh, of what people think are some problems. But I think until we actually meet as a committee to decide, that's gonna be hard to define right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we did, it is pretty broadly based. So I agree with you. And we wanted to give that flexibility to the folks that are on it as well. Um, okay, um, any other follow-up questions from the board? Uh, okay. I mean, I, I, I just a quick question in terms of um, uh, Randy, your your interactions in, in situate that have, have that you've seen that have really you know pushed you towards making a difference here. It's not really the interactions that I've seen here in situate as much as I've seen in other communities. Uh, I think I'm relatively new to situate, and I haven't seen a lot here uh, per se but I've seen it in other communities and I think I can bring that, uh, that percept, you know, that uh, vision here of what I've seen in other communities to make sure that we uh, eliminate it here at Situate where there is any, but I haven't seen a lot in Situate personally, but I do know that it exists. Thank, thank you. Um, Karen? Yeah, uh, nope, I was just gonna say, I thank you so much for your, your raising your hand and and, and waiting to the bottom of the alphabet, as the others have to. Um, shall we move on, Mark? Sure. Uh, our Randy, next, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for coming forward. Our next um, applicant was actually the first applicant, um, and it's our 
friend Nikki Sanders Smead. Nikki, if you would introduce, uh, give your name, your name and your address, please. Hi, I'm Nikki Sanders Smead, and I live at 226 Beaver Dam Road in Situate. Okay. Hi, Nikki. Hello. Thanks for coming forward. Um, so we're gonna go through the same questions to be fair and then other questions as well. Um, so the charge specifies working to eradicate depression, racism, injustice, and violence against all people in our community. Um, why do you think this work is important? Um, I think this work is important because when we first moved here, our, one of our favorite places was also Lucky Finn. And when I was waiting for my latte and delicious scone, et cetera, I ventured around town close by and went into a business and was asked if I was one of the new nannies in town for one of the families here. Um, and that's not the first incident. There are other places I've been in town that I will not return to um where the reception was not welcoming as it was for say a customer directly in front of me um or customers as i was deciding to leave <laughs> so um i think there's a lot of work to be done someone earlier mentioned the situate monthly page i think that speaks volumes and that's where i take my temperature of what's going on in the town i know that it's not completely a reality, but it does give you a sense of what people think is okay to do to other and say to other humans. Um, so I don't take, I, I have two um, babysitters before the pandemic, um, both in their 60s, both white women, um, both natives of this area, Situate and Marshfield, they know both of my neighbors, um, have gone to school with them, and they take amazing care of my children and us. Um, so um, there is a dichotomy of experiences here. And I think on the one hand, people, you know, are happy to meet someone new or learn something new. And you know, interact with someone new. And on the other hand, and it usually is people who have lived here for a very long time, went to high school here, et cetera. And on the other hand, there is this element that is not so interested in that. And that's fine. I don't interact with those people, but um, it does cross over into being beyond offensive. Oops. And so I think- Did I? I'm sorry. My screen froze. I don't know if everybody else's did, so. Oh. I'm having issues. So oh. <laughs> anyway, I think, I think this is an excellent beginning. I think this is an excellent beginning. And I think that um, the fact that the Board of Selectmen has taken this on is, is a very, very positive sign. Well, thank you for that. And I'm sorry I missed some of what you said just because my internet connection went south. Maybe we can get some more diversity in our internet providers. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Um, uh, so um, what experience or skills do you bring to the committee? Um, share with the committee, the other folks here that will help meet the goals of this charge, Nikki. Um, okay, so I went to the Madeira School for Girls in McLean, Virginia um, for three years of high school and Every Wednesday we had volunteer work and in my junior year, we were able to choose a Senator or House of Representative because of the school's connections. And I, of course, chose Ted Kennedy. And so I worked in his office in the Russell building every Wednesday and was allowed to bring him his fish chowder <laughs> um, after his final committee meeting. Um, so I sat in a lot of different hearings and uh, was met a lot of people that I wouldn't have met had I not interned with him. Um, fast forward, I came back here to go to Wellesley College um, because my mother forced me to fill out the application. I ended up having an amazing time. She's always right. Um, and Rodney King riots happened while I was there. 
um, and I was motivated to spend the summer interning with Rita, Congress City Councilwoman Rita Walters in LA. So I spent the summer in South Central. Um, and then I went to law school at Boston College Law School after teaching high school history in Boston at the Jeremiah Burke was my first year. Uh, Latin Academy with uh, Maria Aronson was my second year. And Madison Park High School, which is a vocational school, was my third year before I left to go to BC Law. Um, and while I was at BC, we did a, um, the Jesuits did a mission to Haiti. And so we went and delivered medical supplies in Haiti and met with officials there. Um, so I'm a teacher, a lawyer, and a mom of two. Um, I'm a, the wife of a woman who is a very good fisher, fishing person. Um, I'm the leader of Situate Pride, which did a straight talk. Um, and I was on the panel of the process of coming out. And that's a very, there's a very high suicide rate just before someone comes out of the closet. And so there were discussions on that to make that a little bit more interesting. I think that's now being used by the counselors at the high school and the middle school right now. Um, we also did um, straight talk, uh, race talk recently. I was also on that panel. And on that panel, we discussed several different races and experiences here. We had several members of the Cape Verdean community. Um, and that, that uh, panel video as well is being used for educational purposes beyond situate. Um, I've been watching this process and the development of this committee and the statement so very carefully because I, you know, I love it here. Um, my wife loves it here. Our kids love it here. Um, and we'd like to stay. Um, we came because of longtime residents that we knew. Um, um, I've been friends with Kara Tondorf for 20 years. And so when I saw her, um, you know, out and about in the city, I was like, where should we go? And she's like, come to Situate, you'll love it, da, da, da. And we did, we loved it. Um, but I think things have changed. And I think I bring... Um, Sorry, I think I bring a, a reality and a skill set that is um, has kind of a range from education to uh, grassroots organizing to um, you know just collaborative efforts with people of very different backgrounds and having very tough conversations. And I think that um, that I value the importance of all of that. So, well, thank you. Um, I, I'm, I want to hear more, but I'm going to, in fairness, going to just ask some of these standard questions too, just to be fair, um, Nikki. Um, the, char the charge recommends members, which may be useful to the committee. Do you think the proposed composition is appropriate to meet the goals? Um, I think. I think you, you have to change something. So you either have to change your goals because your goals to eradicate racism and situated, you know, are, 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 are important and lofty. And I would stick with keeping the goals and maybe adjusting how to get there. Um, everyone that you've chosen in the charge to be on the committee is essential. Um, the process of talking about race and ethnicity and um, people with um, physical challenges is very delicate. And I don't think that the information, I don't think the conversations that you want to get based on your statement um, are going to yield the same result as the conversations you'll have with the people that you have on the charge. Does that make any sense? So what I'm saying is you are gonna get a contract evaluation, you're gonna get um, police participation, and uh, you're gonna get 
um, and evaluate with all these people that have interviewed tonight, you're going to have all those things evaluated and contract review is painful, <laughs> but um, I'm willing to participate in that. But you can get that with the, the people you've chosen. What you may not get is some of the more kind of um, it's just amazing ideas that you have in the statement. So I think that requires a different group of people in the room, mainly people of color. So someone mentioned something about at-large members. And um, I think this committee would have to be very active in drawing in at-large members of color. If that's who you choose, if that's who the charge chooses. Do you know what I'm saying? So like, if, if, if you want contract review and you want human resources to fall in line and all, you, just from people who interviewed tonight, you have that plus the people that you've chosen in your charge. But if you want uh, some of the things you've said in your statement, I think that you're gonna have to have different people in the room. And I, and I just wanna reiterate that um, we haven't, you know, chosen anyone we did write may and so if some representatives from those different groups were um didn't come forward we're not going to stop and i'm i'm not i'm gonna this is my opinion i'll let the rest of my board members speak but in my opinion we're not going to stop the process and wait to fill that definition that may be there um so i hope that helps and, it does a lot it does and I, yeah and i think sometimes the, the at large term gets a little confusing i mean that just means like all of you right everyone that's coming forward to come we don't want to put any parameter we just want who wants to help us do this and and get as much you know diversity of thought and viewpoint um as possible so i hope that that helps um and then just lastly um what information do you think the committee will need I think you already kind of answered it, to gather and complete their work and how would you approach obtaining it? Um, some of the stuff that I've kind of been involved in already, like there's a new collaborative group called Situate United. They kind of were the sponsor of the race talk. And um, that involves, you know, um, I, everyone from Meg Summers, who's like head of your uh, disabled disabilities, yep. disabilities head, um, Connor, who spoke tonight, he's done wonderful things in terms of assisting with like, just having communication and um, getting involved on giving kind of <laughs> the not so of color perspective, but in a thoughtful, meaningful way. Um, Stephanie Burke, who's also heavily involved in Situate United and she brings in the uh, um, biracial in understanding and um, being perceived as white when you're not and that experience. So I think you really, and, and, and then people who know them, they bring along with them. So I think you really have to kind of campaign for this kind of committee in a way to draw people in and to have conversations one-on-one -on -one, um, and then to draw them and say, you know, can you come to this meeting and tell me what you just told, tell everybody what you just told me, which yeah. might be hard because you're like, if you choose exactly who interviewed tonight, which I think everyone is a, a wonderful candidate, you're asking someone of color to basically walk into the room with white people and me and Stephanie. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and Miss, Miss Rika. So like, you're asking them to walk into a room and say something very intimate so that everyone can understand what they need to do. So, um, I think, I think you've got to figure out how to get people of color uh, their voice into the conversation on how to change policy and, and contracts and et cetera. And that's tough. That, I think that's, that's the big challenge because you have all the other moving parts of the statement and the correct people. So um, that will be the challenge of this committee. Okay. And I thought Kim earlier had said something very, um, that resonated with me is, her experience in creating, you know, the safe space for everybody to feel comfortable during those discussions. So um, I certainly recognize that that's important. So um, any other board members? And thank you, Nikki. Anybody else have other questions for Nikki? I've, I've talked to Nikki quite a bit, so. Yeah. We didn't get the hook. <laughs> Wait, <that's laughs> oh, right, I'm not moving. Um, I just, I don't have a question. I've had an opportunity to get to, uh, to know you a little bit, but, um, 
I did want to note the race talk was uh, presentation was really good, and I learned a lot. Is there some place that people can find the video? Is there a video out there, and can people access it who might want who might have missed it? Yes, yes, there is a video out there. Um, I think um, it's posted on Situate United for Action on Equality, the new group. But you can also contact me. I will send you directly to Lauren Allen Smith, who is wonderful at um, keeping track of these things, videos, comments, um, different contacts. Um, and we can get a copy of that to you if, if you'd like it. Sure. Okay. Great. You can also mm -hmm. email okay. situatepride at gmail.com. Just email situatepride at gmail.com and she'll send you a link. Thanks, Steph. Um, Lauren, can I ask one question? Yep. Hi, Nikki. Thanks for, for applying. Um, I, I just have a question for you. You're, you're involved with a lot of groups. Um, and how, how do you see the role, your role in those groups and your role on this committee, the difference between them? Um, well, major difference is time commitment. Um, the good news is that those groups are kind of up and running and we're doing planning and those things will take off on their own. Um, I think this committee is more inclusive in terms of a lot of those people have already bought in, right? So a lot of those people in those groups, they're like, yeah, we trans rights, this is our focus, or, you know, we've got to do something about the perception of, you know, brown skin in the town. So they've bought in. And I feel like this committee is more about, um, bringing other people to the table to find their place. So maybe you're not fully on board with certain things, but you believe in like the basic, like everyone should be comfortable living here. You know what I'm saying? And like what that means if you've never experienced living in a similar community or next door or close by someone who's not like you. You know, if you've always lived in situate your whole life, I, my babysitters don't go beyond Braintree. They never have. They've never gone beyond Braintree. One of them just took a flight to Florida, like just. So living amongst people who come from the South End, as well as people who come from Marshfield, right, and have never gone beyond Duxbury, you know, I think bringing, I think this committee is about um, bringing those people kind of into the fold. That being said, it is okay, in my opinion, to have a committee that is solely based on finding equity solutions for people of color. I don't see anything wrong with that, even in a 98% white community. And the reason is that we don't look like the rest of the world. We just don't, okay, we don't. But we have to act like the rest of the United States in that we can't have certain things going on that are not appropriate or safe or equal in our schools, in the way we do business, in the way we contract, we can't have that. So I think I learn a lot from those groups. I know a lot being who I am, but I learn a lot from those groups. And I think um, it's made me feel more confident in saying, yeah, I mean, we do need something for just the folks that don't look like most people around here and that's okay. So um, I, don't see, I don't see there being a conflict because I feel like both the committee and the groups I work with are working for the same kind of. Yeah, goal. I didn't. I, yeah, I didn't mean a conflict. I meant kind of the clearly the goals of the two groups are different, right? There's there's one as and you articulated that a second ago, right? Um, um, but but the theme is the same, you know. Yes. The, um, so I, I think that's that was kind of my my point that. Um, um, you know, the municipality um, structure has limitations where maybe, uh, you know, outside groups don't. So. Yeah, the min municipality yeah. structure has uh, a great deal more limitations than people arguing over, like, you know, who's going to lead what <laughs> you know, right. for the next meeting. And it's just, and that could be a good thing because these things can be kind of, you know, sensitive. But I do think for this type of committee, there is room to have real discussions, major discussions on race and on uh, being gay. I mean, though, this has to be a part of the work that this particular committee does. It has to be a focus of the work, 
I think um, you're right. Yeah, I, I, and I, I know we're running late here, and, oh, sorry. and you've yeah. said a lot, but but I do want to thank you for flying, <laughs> and and I do agree with you 100. percent Those conversations, right. I think all of us expect to occur in these meetings. Right. This isn't just let's read a contract Absolutely. and change this pronoun yeah. type stuff. Right, because we yeah. won't get there. Yeah, right. I get right. it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for applying. Thank you. All right. You're doing a bad job, timekeeper. I know. I, I forgot to push the button that time. <laughs> um, we have one, two, three, four, five more um, interviews this evening. And uh, Mara, are you happy continuing on with sure. the? Okay. Um, and it, I do want to ask our woman behind the curtain who has to take all the minutes and all of this, would you like a five minute, or a, let's make it a three minute break to go stretch your fingers? Oh. Nikki, think that's a good idea. Rain, we're putting all the pressure on you. Yeah, I think it would be great. <laughs> okay, I, uh, poor thing, she's tethered to her computer. Um, so I'm, I apologize to the S's and the T's, and, and Ruth, you are not last but least. <laughs> not least but, well, you know what I mean. This is why we need a three minute break. It is nine o'clock exactly. So uh, let's, um, let's start the, the video up in 9.03, if that's all right with everyone. Hey. <laughs> Our timekeeper's not here. Um, there's Tony having his dinner. <laughs> there. Um, uh, Lorraine, are you ready to begin? She's the most important one in this equation. <laughs> All right, she's still muted. Lorraine, let us know when you're ready. Um, uh, Maura, Ms. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, Mr. Goodrich has agreed to take us home, be our bat our cleanup batter. Alrighty. <laughs> um, so I will ask um, our uh, Thomas. Now, hopefully, I'll say this right. Seeker. 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 Ah. All right. Well, thank you That's for waiting. Right. Letting us have a break. It's always awful when you're the one that's like, oh, I was almost there. <laughs> uh, but I will turn you over. If you'll just state your address and uh, name for the record, and then Mr. Vin, uh, Mr. Uh, Goodrich will handle the procedure. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tom Secor, 14 Beacon Road, Constituent. Great. Well, Tom, thank you for, uh, for raising your hand and um, offering to get involved. Uh, we've been talking about the charge for a while, but um, why is this work? Uh, so critically important uh, here in town, and, and what do you think, um, uh, why it's so important? Yeah, thank you. Um, I have to say, uh, those are some incredibly tough acts to follow. So you guys, you have your work cut out for you in, uh, in making the, the decisions. Um, they've, been, they've been inspiring, frankly. Uh, I mean, I, I do have... I do have a lot of passion uh, about this. Um, I certainly acknowledge, not just in Situate, but I mean, and, and not just in the U.S. Because you know, I I have work colleagues in in the U.K. and so forth, and they also acknowledge the systemic systemic racism uh, issues that are plaguing really aspects of the globe. Uh, right now, you know, as it pertains to my own personal uh, passion or uh, affinity for this for this work, uh, I mean, I've I've witnessed it. I have three kids that have gone through Situate schools, uh, one of which is still in the high school, another is at Gates, um, and then I have a daughter who just graduated, and you know, we. We have friends uh, that are in the Situate schooling system that uh, live in Dorchester, for example, um, part of the METCO program. They're at our house a lot. And it's not just the recent in incidents that have occurred in the schools. It's stuff that's happened going back to early elementary school. And they've, they've talked to us about it and they're tired and they're in pain and i mean certainly in, in recent days uh last last couple of years and since all the incidents that happened uh in the spring and throughout the summer with george floyd and brianna taylor and 
about our poverty and so forth. I mean, the rhetoric, the rhetoric has really increased, okay, nationwide, and incidents have continued to occur in this community. Um, I've been, I've gone to some of the stand-ups. Um, I'm often the oldest guy there. Uh, some of the BLM uh, stand-ups in Hingham at the Rotary, and I've 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 attended those when without the other side there, right? So without a, a counter protest. And I've personally seen the, some of the filth from the people that take it upon themselves to roll down their window, roll down their window and just spew things that I don't want to say. Just because we're standing there with a Black Lives Matter sign. And I mean, I, I acknowledge I don't know everything about this issue, far from it. Uh, I read uh, just today or yesterday the, the stride note that was put in the Mariner and I kind of, I was drawn to one comment where they basically said that um, they, they're on their own personal journeys and they don't claim expertise. I don't claim expertise. I'm trying to educate myself and I want to give back. I'm passionate about it. Thank you. What, um, what sort of skills and experience um, would you bring to the committee uh, to meet the goals? And also, um, I guess we can build in uh, Tony's question from earlier uh, about your experience here in Situate and your involvement in Situate on um, you know, anything else. Yeah, around town, so. yeah thanks. Um, look, I, I, I probably have to echo how uh, Connor answered this question, right? So um, a lot of it's life experience. I mean, I can talk about my my day job and so forth. Um, I do not have the resume that uh, some of the other people, uh, the fine applicants have had um, over the past you know hour and a half that we've been uh, talking talking to the uh, committee. Uh, I mean, I certainly have an affinity for volunteerism, whether it's locally here uh, with the Situate Basketball Association, for example. I've also been uh, the chairman of a nonprofit, uh, the BNB Cancer Foundation that was actually founded in Braintree, uh, which I have a connection to. Uh, within, within my job, uh, I started a consulting company about 20 years ago, and we are not a diverse uh, company. And uh, it's something that, you know, we've wanted to address for a long time, but I'll be honest with you, I was silent about it, like a lot of people have been silent about it. And, you know, you, you hear the term silence is compliance. And so since all the triggers that have happened over the last several months, uh, I've brought in a, to train the whole company on conscious inclusion. I started a diversity and inclusion group, uh, I guess, despite being a middle-aged straight white guy. Um, I, you know, we've created other forms within the company. Uh, and I think it's been, I think it's been a good step, but that that's addressing things kind of in my professional life which I think is super important, but I personally would get a lot more out of helping the community, more from a grassroots level. I'd like nothing more than to work with you guys. And frankly, whether I get selected or not, I'm going to be active, right? So whether it would, I get, there's other avenues for me, right? I could get involved with Stride. There's a number of other uh, organizations that are, that are, you know, spouting up that I want to be a part of. Um, I mean, from a situate standpoint, I, I've been in situate for 10 years, right? So uh, I moved here, similar story to a lot of people, uh, found a great community, and I do love it here. Uh, but I also acknowledge that racism exists here. Racism exists in a lot of, in, in a lot of communities. Uh, this, is no, this is no different. And uh, it's something that I want to work to eradicate. But it's going to be a long journey. I think I, f I forget who mentioned it. Uh, 
and I'd probably have to take another look, but um, this is something that's not going to be fixed in six months. It's not going to be fixed in a year. I mean, this is something that's been going on for 401 years. I mean, it's, it's, there's a, there's a whole list of things that need to get tackled, but we need, it can't be a moment. It can't be a moment. We have to continue to move forward. Uh, what are your thoughts on the, the composition of the board? Um, I think that this question was actually, and Madam Chair, excuse me if I'm overstepping, but it, I thought this was more about having the HR director and some other town staff and kind of your thoughts on making sure that uh, those folks are involved. In it, and if you think that uh, aligns with the mission. Was that a question for the chair? No, I'm sorry, for you, I, I was just saying. I will allow it, how's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now, I have to echo what pretty much everybody else has said. Um, uh, you know, the previous applicant, I think, you know, she really she really nailed it and um, had given it a lot of thought. I think the only, the only thing that I saw that uh, may or may not be missing is business ownership, whether that's uh, Chamber of Commerce, something along those lines, because I, I do think, and I, I haven't heard uh, a lot about it, uh, you know, tonight, but, you know, what can we do to entice businesses? There's a lot of, there's a lot of vacanc vacancies on Front Street, right? So uh, do we, and I, I don't know the answer to this, but I mean, do we have any black minority LGBTQ plus owned businesses in such a, I don't know the answer to that. Um, that would be one of the first things I think that this committee should, should look at. How can we foster not only bringing those types of businesses into the town, but also can we kept the spending power of existing businesses of the town uh, to invest in black owned businesses or any type of diverse uh, owned businesses uh, to try to, there's an economic aspect, right? To, to systemic racism. Uh, there's a whole list of things that have been impacted, but that's one of them. And, and what, what sort of information uh, do you think the committee is going to need to gather um, to complete to complete the work. Yeah, I, it's it's a blessing and a curse to go this late um, because <laughs> there's so there have been so many uh, so many things that people have mentioned that um, all make sense. Uh, you know, I I, I just touched on a few, right? So around around business practices, um, support of uh, specific kind of diverse businesses, um, getting them into situate, uh, investing in them, even if they're not in situate from, again, from a spending power standpoint, which is something that we've done in my company. Uh, training, I, just last week, I uh, dialed into one of the Zoom calls with uh, Dr. McGuire, and some of the school administration and I just point blank asked them and I, I just said have you guys gone through training have you gone through any type of unconscious bias conscious inclusion type training and I shared with them some of the information really just a PowerPoint deck that uh, that that was utilized in the training for our company that I think we all gained a lot from it was we but we were just uh, scratching the surface on this um, there's so much more that needs to be done but I think it did awaken certain things in my company and got people talking although there were still a lot of people that were silent hmm. uh, okay madam chair uh, great um Thank you so much. Um, does the board have any follow-up questions? I think you're right. There's a, you know, it's okay to say I agree with them, you know, because we've got, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, does anyone yeah. have other questions? No? I just have one quick question. Um, 
Tom, how are you? I know you well. I know your you and your family's dedication to the town and the service um, and just your job commitments, like all of us. Um, what about the time commitment to this committee and and um, and finding that and mixing that all into to life? Well, Tony, as you may know, my my basketball coaching career is just about over. <laughs> um, so I'll leave that to uh, I'll leave that to Sarah Tondor. Um, at the high school level, uh, but it's a great question. I mean, but that does open a lot of time for me. Um, and COVID isn't going away. Uh, I've learned to work at home. Um, and this is something, look, if, if I was fortunate enough to be given the opportunity, um, you wouldn't be able to get rid of me. I would be, I would be involved. I would be involved. I, I, that is something that, I didn't even have to ask my wife. I mean, she wants me to do it, right? So this is something that our whole family is passionate about. So uh, the time commitment would be there. Great. Thanks for applying. Thanks, Tony. All right, our uh, next up is Kate Swoop. Kate, thank you for being so patient. Uh, name and address, and Andy will walk us through the questions. Hi, uh, my name is Kate Swoop. I live at 95 Turner Road. Great. Well, thank you. Um, again, thank you for putting your hand up and, and um, trying to get involved here. So again, we've talked about the charge, but why is this work both important for the town and, and, and for you? I think this work is critically important. As many people have mentioned before, it's important not just now, it's been important for hundreds of years. You know, when I think about doing work around equity and equality, I think about being very intentional about it. And I think that's critically important. So I've lived in Situate for three years. I live here with my wife, our two-year-old son, and our miniature schnauzer. And when I was looking around for a place to raise my, you know, raise my new little family, I came across Situate and was so impressed. I'm from a small town right by the water in Maine and thought, I didn't know towns like this still existed. You know, and so when I think about why it is so critically important, I think about the fact that Situate is such a beautiful place to live and it is filled with largely beautiful people. And if we didn't very intentionally do work, it would be a real disservice. Um, my best friend is a black woman. She lives in Boston. I've been trying since I moved here to get her to move here and she says no. She says, I, I walk through the town, I don't feel comfortable. Um, and I, feel really bad about that because I feel both really proud to live here and by and large have been very well accepted, but, you know, not being straight, uh, I also have felt very different and had some different, different interactions. And so I think that this beautiful town really deserves the very intentional, the very hard, the very brave work that the committee is looking to do. Thank you. Um, can you kind of touch upon your experience, uh, both you know, in this realm and just uh, in general, um, you know, kind of your background uh, in this space? Sure. Um, so I have spent about the last 20 years working in social service nonprofits. So working in public health, HIV and AIDS, homelessness, um, and a wide variety of other causes. So I have a long background in sort of social service, having these really hard conversations, advocating for folks that don't always have a voice aren't able to have their voice amplified. Um, currently, I am the director of property management for a large uh, property management real estate firm. And um, my one of the charges that we have is to make sure that we're following fair housing practices, which um, I think is, is really important. You're looking at not just are we being uh, intentionally you know, discriminatory or trying to avoid that, what are all of the other steps that we may not be thinking about that could lead to unintentional uh, discrimination or bias, unconscious bias, or the perception of that? And so that's a huge part of my professional work as well. Um, also, my live experience as a lesbian does not, a, not in any way equate to live experience with people of color. However, I have an interesting opportunity to walk through as a minority and a majority in different spaces. Um, and so I think that does give me some perspective. Um, I am also uh, a founding member of a diversity, equity, and inclusion group for my company. So that's something that we're working on as well. So a lot of experience in that space. Um, 
I was a board member of Mass Equality, which is an LGBTQ statewide organization for a couple years as well. Uh, so have some experience in that. Great, thank you. Um, again, so, so the, the composition of the board, um, if you're taking a look at it um, closely, do you think um, how, it's, how it's constructed now, do you think that aligns with the mission? You know, improvements, deletions, what, what are your kind of general thoughts? Um, I, echo, I echo my co-applicants. You have to start somewhere. Um, I, I'm glad to hear that there's flexibility in that um, because most importantly, I would wanna make sure that people of color are represented regardless of if they're members at large or if they work within the situate system. Um, and I think also there's a lot that we'll learn as we move forward in this process. And then the, the information you think um, you would need, um, you know, to be, to get everything that we that that we need to get done. Is there are there any areas of information you really want to look into? And also, um, what are general thoughts? You know, I think we need. There's an awful lot of information we need. Um, you know, when I think about it, I think about gathering some some data, specifically thinking about for. We're going to be looking at, I know, future policies and procedures, but what about past policies and procedures and how have those played out for residents of Situate and how does that slice around race and other, and other minority groups? So I think looking both past at the data that currently exists would be really important. I think doing larger uh, surveys of the residents as well as having individual interviews and conversations with residents is critically important. Um, also, uh, Mr. Goodrich, I really appreciate your comment around public health. You know, as, as we know, the intersectionality between COVID-19 and dis disproportionate poor health outcomes for communities of color and other minority communities are huge. It's something that we've known for a very long time, but it's really being spotlighted right now. And so I think also public health will be critically important. Excellent. Great. Madam Chair. Sorry, I muted, the dog was barking. Um, does anyone from the board have any additional questions for Ms. Swope? No, um, I, I have to say, sorry, Mark? I just wanna say it was a great, she has a great resume and thank you for coming forward. Yeah, I think we usually get, I mean, this is a lot of interviews to do at once when we really wanted to do it. And um, I, I can tell you, I'm not getting blurry eyed because everybody has something to offer. So thanks for staying up with us. Um, if no one else has a question, our next candidate is Richard Taft. Mr. Taft is in a, oh, there you are. <laughs> All right, you're unmuted. If you'll give your name and address and Andrew will walk us through. You can hear me, right? Yes. Great. Uh, Richard Taft, I live on 74 Brook Street. Um, I moved to Situate about uh, six or seven years ago, and um, it's been a great place to live. Great. Andrew? Yes. So why is this work so critically important, not just now, but in the town, and, but also um, just, your, just your thoughts on why it's important? And, and I know not, not to try to be the same with everyone else, but it's um, you kind of focus around, you know, in town, why you think that's important. Um, well, I'll try and be a little different. I'm not sure I'm going to quite give you an in-town answer. Um, and I've thought about this a lot in applying for this position and wanting to be part of it. And in doing that, I, you know, a famous person once said that the greatness of America lies not in being more enlightened, but the ability to uh, fix her faults. And that's a really optimistic way to think about, not just uh, you know America, but Situate. We have the opportunity to fix things. And I believe that the things that we have in common can fix those things. I believe in civil debate. It's so lacking in, uh, in our world, um, but it's necessary. Uh, I believe in universal human rights. I believe in the freedom of expression. I believe in the respect to, for different viewpoints and honest debate. I believe in the presumption of innocence. These sound like really old fashioned things, but 
they took a long time to, uh, to work their way through our country. It didn't happen in one day. Um, and we've kind of forgotten that. And what really made me think about that was recently, over the last six months, everybody works in their buildings. And I'm a kind of like a specialist in ventilation systems and air conditioning, been doing it for 30 years, designing them, writing standards and codes for them, all kinds of things like that. And people now are like, wow, we need to ventilate our building to make it safer. My goodness, thank goodness you finally figured that out. We've been doing it forever and we just neglected it. We just like, you know, we don't need that ventilation in there. The same thing is true of these kind of really fundamental things that we all believe in. But we need to dust them off a little bit and shine them up and figure out how they're relevant to today. And those things, those liberal values, I mean, when you really think about it, it abolished slavery. It, it, it got us to the civil rights movement. It, it got women the right to vote. It passed Title IX. I'm so glad my daughter can try and get a scholarship in swimming or something like that. Uh, passed the American Disabilities Act. People who were disabled have so many more things today than they had just 20 years ago. Uh, it allowed same-sex marriage. I mean, these, this kind of like I said, it's like that ventilation. It's the, it's the life breath. And we keep trying to look around for something new. And we keep forgetting that we got this really shine. We got this really great fundamental foundation. We need to shine it up. And, um, and we need to adapt it. I mean, one of the things that everybody realizes is that we've neglected some things. We've neglected these very basic things in looking at um, this issue. And one of the things that we did, we said, well, everybody needs to be colorblind. And colorblind is great, but colorblind also can prevent us from seeing when color's a problem. You know, when we're, when we're using colorblindness to you know, create inequity and racial injustice, right? But vigilance is an old, maybe I'm just an old man, but it's an old concept and we've got the tools to, to really fix this. And so that's kind of, you know, what is inspiring me to try and do this. Thank you. What, um, you t touched on it a little bit, but um, can you just talk more about just kind of your experience writ large uh, yeah, no, so this is a, you know, and this is one of these things where, look, I've been, I've actually been all over. I lived in Atlanta for 14 years, 15 years. Um, you know, it had a slogan, the, the town that was too busy to hate. And uh, Atlanta and Birmingham, if you don't know this, but you have to kind of live there, were the same size cities in the early 70s and late 60s. And Atlanta today is a cosmopolitan, thriving, it's a leading city, not just in the United States, but in the world. And one of the reasons is, is, is that it figured out how to address racial inequality without making people hate each other. Birmingham <laughs> didn't do that. Um, so in my, so that's one thing, you know, you come from a place and I, I grew up in Rhode Island. So I moved down there, talk about eye opening, way more diverse population. I lived in Montreal for four years at one point in my career. And, you know, we talk about America being a melting pot, but when I moved to Montreal, I had to, I had so many people from so many parts of the world and they weren't first generation. They just came over. They got their green card. They came there and they were really humbling to talk to. And they were so humbling because I said to my wife, these people are the ultimate entrepreneurs they left everything behind and they didn't just leave everything behind in one day. They waited seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years to get a, a card just to leave everything that was in Egypt or in Russia or, and they were humbling. And it made me believe in the power of diversity and immigration. And, um, you know, it's those kinds of experience. I've had them all. I, I spent a lot of time in India. Uh, what I found in spending time in India and China and Europe is for all of our differences, we have so many things that are the same. Our, we want to, you go to China, you go to India, 
those parents want their kids to have a better life. Um, and that made me believe that even though we have so much that we're different about, we have so many things that we want and that are common. <clears throat> and so those are the experiences I bring. And I've been able to live them all over. Thank you. Um, look, looking at the composition of the board, do you think that it's that it aligns with the mission? And you know, with that, are we, is there? The thing about the board is um, it's really hard to say, well, you know, this group or this police chief or, you know, the HR person, because, you know, we really don't know them. But I think the thing that we have to insist on is an open mind. We have to insist that um, this isn't going to get solved with a slogan. We don't have any sacred cows. Um, and we have to be able to talk about tough issues. If the people that come to those meetings and are part of this advisory group are willing to make hard conversations and have an open mind and be willing to have their mind changed. Again, building on what I just said a minute ago, there's no mountain we can't overcome. What sort of information are you looking for uh, to gather uh, to make sure that the committee can complete its work? You know, I've, I've been reading loads. I actually, I love to learn. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm older, I'm in my mid fifties. I started learning how to play the piano just recently. Um, we need to be able to want to learn. We got to learn from not just, um, you know, data and people. We, we need to bring in voices that have had experiences, but we also need to look at our history. And I don't just mean like situate history. I mean, these problems have been around for a long time. And like I said, we've slowly, slowly crushing them, uh, but we haven't been doing them fast enough. And in our day and age, when we have to do everything yesterday, it's definitely not fast enough. But we got to look at history. We've got to look at other places. Like I said, Atlanta was a town that was that had the slogan, too, too busy to hate. And white people, black people, they have reached across and it was hard. You read the history of what Atlanta did, it wasn't easy. And the guys and the people that reached across each other, um, they made mistakes. And um, so, you know, we just need, we need people to look at all kinds of different information. We need people to understand that there's a difference between correlation and causation. Um, so data, stories, history, we need all of that stuff. Thank you. Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Goodrich. Um, and thank you, Mr. Taft. Uh, does the board have any follow-up questions? That's a lot of information, thank you. I'm not seeing anyone. Um, great, well, thank you so much for staying late with us. And uh, <laughs> Mr. Taylor, George Taylor is next on our list uh, at 9.36. So thanks, we know you can work long on the committee if you've stuck around for this. Uh, George, I will ask you to give your name for the record and turn the questions back over to Mr. Goodrich. Uh, George Taylor, 646 Country Way. Can you hear me? Yes. yes sir. Oh, good, thank goodness. I got the technology piece down. <laughs> well, George, thank you um, for, for your interest. So why, why is this work important today? Well, you know, I, I believe it's situate, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, situate and its diversity and the problems. And, you know, I think situate is just a, it's a microcosm of a, of a, of a larger country, the larger issue, you know, we, we've seen it for many years. You know, I've been in this town for 35 years now. I moved here 35 years ago. I spent a lot of time in youth sports. Um, I was president of Citroen Little League. I um, did a lot of work in youth football, youth soccer, baseball specifically. And, you know, when you see the kids in sports, you know, they're just a, they're just a reflection of their families. You know, the, you know, youth sports are a reflection of what's going on in the town. And, you know, I have to say, you know, we used to see a lot of problems in those, in those areas. We saw a lot of kids that, you know, were coming from, you know, different backgrounds. They were having some problems. It, it, it you know, it was, it was clearly evident that we had problems then. And, you know, obviously we're still having problems today. So, 
you know, I, I, I come to this with kind of a, lifer, a little bit of a different approach. You know, my, my background and whatnot is I look at the process. And, you know, I look to say, okay, if we can put aside all the pressures that are coming at us from a lot of different directions, and there are a lot of pressures from a lot of different directions. You know, we had discussions earlier, you were talking about on the change of one or two words, and you kind of saw what, you know, the, the interest and the, and the dialogue that that created. So I think if we can come up with a grassroots kind of model that we can use going forward, I look at this problem as creating a model that we can use in Situate for a long time to come, from information gathering to looking at these issues and moving forward, because that's really my background. Um, that's what I do for a living. So I look at it and say, we clearly all agree that we have a problem. We know that we have to move forward. How are we gonna do that? So that's, that's the way I kind of approach this. Great, thank you. Uh, you, I, you just touched upon it about your experience, um, you know, both in town, but it, do you have any experience um, either professionally or, or um, just in this space in, in general, um, talking or tackling some of these, um, some of these issues? You know, I have, because I, you know, I've been working for a company for a long time. We have a lot of training that we've gone through. Um, I, you know, I do not have, as one gentleman stated earlier, I do not have the resume in the background of a lot of these people that are directly related to this, to this, to this problem, this subject. I just come at it from, you know, a clearly different perspective. Um, you know, a long time in business, a long time going through this, um, you know, and a long time of problem solving. And that's where I look at this and say, I believe I bring value to the, to the situation to be able to say, hey, we have a lot of people with a lot of diverse backgrounds. We have a lot of people that are clearly very smart people that are looking at this issue. But I think you need all type of backgrounds to be able to do it. And that's where I think I can bring value to this process. Great, thank you. The, again, so the, the composition of the board, um, are we, what are your thoughts on it? Are we missing? Are we, should we be yeah. additive? You know, the curse, the curse is I didn't have to, the, the good thing is I didn't have to go first because that would not have been good. The last thing being almost last, I'm not so sure I can say anything new to that except for, you know, I really, really believe that as long as we're open-minded and as long as we're being able to talk to each other and as long as we were respectful for each other's opinions, that I think that the group that you're talking about and the people that you're putting together, I think there's a very, very background there. And I think that is an outstanding way to approach it because the more that we can become collaborative and the more that we can work together and again, create that model, I think that's a big thing to overcome in its own right. And if you can overcome that and you can get these people into a collaborative mode to be able to move forward with this, I think that, I, I think that that's a huge hurdle and, it, and it, it, it will help do nothing but help in the long run to solve some of these problems that clearly need to be solved. Thank you. And, and the information piece. So, so what sort of information, um, both the, the committee needs, but also, you know, personal interest for you, for whatever you want to dig into. Um, you know, it was interesting because when I was reading over the charge of the committee, I wrote it down into two groups. One was, you know, policies, procedures, and budgets to promote equity and inequality. And then the second half was focus on eradicating you know, oppression, racism, injustice, and violence against all. So the first thing I wrote down on my list, which was going to be a question to you, is how does the committee get informed on this? So it's, to me, it's, it's, it's the biggest issue of everything that we're looking at. The model that says, how do we gather information? Because, you know, stories and knowledge and past experiences are very important. And then there's the data side, which is also really important. But I think creating that model of data gathering or information gathering, I think that's the first and largest hurdle that we're gonna go through as a committee. So I believe once we resolve that and create the model, then we can go out and gather through personal interviews, through you know, mining data out of you know, probably countless different areas. So I, I do believe that that is the most important and I do think that in the very beginning, that's gonna be the biggest focus of the committee as to how we do that. And we're, again, we're going to have to do that in a collaborative mode to be able to work together to come up with a base, a model to say, how are we going to do this? 
Thank you. I mean, again, touched on it before. I mean, one of my passions is, is public health and making sure that this, you know, committee is talking about that. So I appreciate you uh, and others have, have, have talked about the, the collection of, of, of data and how that, that matters. But um, thank you. Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, you know, I have, I will, I'm just going to jump in and say thank you, George, for staying up and for raising your hand. I would have thought after 11 other interviews that we wouldn't have anything new added. And I am very pleased that I'm, <laughs> you brought, no, you brought up things. That, and I think that's what the beauty of, of everyone that has volunteered to participate in this exactly right is you need a lot of different pers perspectives and skills. And I, I'm thrilled um, that, you know, it's very evident that that has the, the pool from which we get to choose. It's going to be difficult, but. Oh, I, I you know, I, I, right now I wouldn't want to have your job because I think it's a very difficult <laughs> job. I mean, I commend everybody who's gone in front of me. There have been some amazing people that have gone through this process. And I was actually glad to be witness to it and be able to see all those people. Yeah, that's why we put you almost last. <laughs> does, <laughs> does, anyone, does anyone else have uh, any questions for Mr. Taylor? Yeah. Then with great fanfare, I would like to ask <laughs> Ruth. I just want to say thank you for allowing me to speak. <laughs> oh, thank you, George. I would like Ruth um, to um, be unmuted and to please uh, um, introduce yourself and give your address and be our final interview for this evening. Thank you. I, I hope I am unmuted now, right? You are. <laughs> Good. Um, Ruth Yassine, 21 Beacon Road. Ruth, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for um, you know, volunteering and, and um, to trying to help out here. So I'll, I'll get right to it. Why is this work so important right now? And that's such a good question because this work is so important in general. Um, I think right now we've seen multiple issues flare up in our society that made it seem as though now is different than before. And I know with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, um, those are thing, things that have highlighted um, underlying problems that our society has had. And so I don't think it's just right now. I do think that these are things that we have lived with. Um, my family has been in Situate for 29 years and we're, though I am white, my uh, husband and children and now grandchildren and daughters-in-law, uh, we are a very multiracial family. And my children growing up here experienced racism. They experienced um, name calling based on, you know, what they look like, what their religion was. We're also Muslim. So these are parts of our background um, that reflect situate, not as the way I want to see it. And so, you know, it is a horrible thing that horrible things are happening now that kind of bring this to the forefront, but this is almost long overdue. We need to become a more diverse community. And I think it is enriching for all of us to become so. And I think that we also need to look at what we can do to move along our dialogue uh, beyond uh, where we are now and be more inclusive and make the changes that we need to make. Thank you. Um, just give me, if you can touch upon your, your, um, your experience, uh, both in this, in this space, um, you know, professionally, um, per, and also personally in town, kind of your connection, going back to um, uh, Mr. Vigiani's comments before. Um, yeah, if you can talk about your experience uh, through this, would be great, thank you. I think that's my easiest part because I'm very well grounded here. As again, it's been 29 years. Um, my kids have gone through the schools. Um, I have worked as a nurse and the last 15 years as a teacher at Gates Intermediate School. So there's a lot of really familiar faces here, <laughs> whether as parents or as students. Um, I think that the, uh, I've mentioned the fact that we deal with race and religion within our family. That's something that is important to us and something that is part of my background that I bring to this. Um, I do feel that I am a learner as far as developing my within this kind of space. Um, it's interesting to kind of get it out of what we talk about at home and, and into a larger community. Um, 
what I think I bring to the table is knowledge of situate. Um, again, I've been on various uh, school committees, uh, not the school committee, but various committees at the schools um, over the many years. Um, I was part of the Unity Council. I am now a steering committee, committee member for STRIDE. Um, and in my own um, ways in education, have always sought to include pieces dealing with racial and other injustices that kids see and making them think and talk about it. So that's something that I feel comfortable with dealing with people talking, conversing and learning. Um, I think it's way time to get past the sound bites that often provoke knee jerk reactions. Uh, we see too much of that in our town right now, especially on social media. And we need to start dealing with the nuances so we can get a bigger picture of how do we really make change within this town. And, and it's an immense undertaking because I think it's very resistant um, to change. And I think we are going to have an uphill battle to have change. And again, I commend this committee uh, for starting this board. What are your, to the composition of the board, are we missing? Should we be additive? What are your thoughts on the composition? And does it meet the, the uh, mission, excuse me? I'm very glad that we have um, people from town. Um, it's important to have these um, town representatives, whether um, the board, the select board members, the um, safety committee, uh, because all of this, we need to be working again, as I feel like I'm almost stealing from other people, um, as George Taylor was saying, the collaborative word. We, we need to be able to be collaborative while we have this process going and we need those members as part of this, you know, just having outside people then tell people as who are part of town, oh, this is what you're gonna to have to do because we said so. No, this has got to be a joint effort. And I think that that's gonna be a really important piece to have things work. Um, I think that the breadth of people who've been here today is awe-inspiring. And I think that adding these people in with their various backgrounds um, I think is really important. I think it is p important to have a variety of people's backgrounds, ethnically, religiously, um, gender identities. I mean, there's so many different things to add. I, I don't think we can actually include everybody in the world, but there is a thought of, you know, I think it's like five members at large. Do we need seven? Could we, I mean, you guys are gonna start making some hard decisions. If your hard decision is this one or that one, and they're both so important, well, maybe take both because I think we do have a lot, and that's the next question, um, that we're gonna have to deal with. And there's gonna be a lot of work and a lot of slogging work. And um, to have more people to share the load is not a bad thing. And I know you don't want 60 people. <laughs> so oh, on the one, the one thing I do feel though, the, the thing mentioned earlier, I do think we're missing that liaison with the school because the school is incredibly important and I'm very glad that they have their own committee, but I don't think we can we need to be able to kind of have some touch base with that and how does that work? Okay, thank you. Uh, information, so what, what sort of information do you think the committee needs? But this is, it's also, you know, what, what are you looking for? What, what, what are you trying to, you know, dig your teeth into to, to, to look, uh, to find and, and to, to make some of these decisions? Again, I think one of the things we're gonna to have to do first is prioritize and get out on the table the issues that people really feel are most important to deal with because there are so many we could get bogged down and get nothing done. Um, for me personally, I think, especially with the issues that have happened uh, recently, that some police issues are things that you need to talk about. It's uncomfortable, but I think it's both for safety of community members as well as safety of our men in blue. These are things that need to get put out on the table People need to look at the policies and procedures that we have. Are we ensuring safety for, again, all of our community? So that's my personal one. But it, there's going to be a lot of pieces that we need to go through, and we're going to need documents from town. I think it's really important that we talk to community members, have maybe forums where people share their experiences on this sector that we're talking with now. Um, I think it would be awesome if this is not just a 12-month Group. I think that there's so many ideas, as you see coming up today, that the, those top priority issues are just the tip of the iceberg.
of what we could do. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Madam Chair. Thank you. Sorry, I'm writing so many notes. Um, thank you, Ruth. Thank you for waiting and being so patient. I, um, I think next time we have a big group, I'm going to go reverse alphabetical, just to be fair. Um, does uh, anyone have any other questions from the board for anybody that we still have a great deal of people still with us? Um, Ms. Curran? Madam Chair, I don't have a question for uh, Ruth. Ruth, thank you for coming forward. Um, I think your perspective will be really important. Um, but I wanted to clear up, we did say just as before we move forward that it's a two year term. And I think the 12 month mark is really more, you know, within 12 months coming, you know, maybe it's a first phase, right? After right. Good. what do we need to do? But I wanted to make sure that folks knew that um, we did sort of agree that it was like a two year term. Um, so that would be a minimum and obviously, you know, pending the success of it, hopefully yeah. you know, it, it'll just carry on too. That happens quite a bit when we add new committees as well. So um, I, I think it's all, I just wanna make, clarify that for everybody. Thank you. Great, thank you so much more for pointing that out. I think one of the things Ruth just said was really important for everyone to keep in mind is that, you know, there will undoubtedly be resistance either within the committee or as policies are presented and that the commitment to this is is critical to its success so thank you for pointing that out um, as i said at the beginning there are i um three or four i know mr vignani i will get to you <laughs> three or four uh other candidates that will be interviewed on um 11 um on november 3rd which i think there's something else going on that day but we'll try to get through quickly and um and then the board will have the difficult duty of trying to put the group together. Uh, somebody did mention something really important that, um, you know, there's so many people here that have so much to offer. And this is one way that we're going to work within sort of the town government's space to make improvements. But there, as has been noted, so many positive new groups that have popped up that can start to do important, well, I shouldn't say start, continue to do the work that they've begun on community conversations, which I think will go a long way to educating and changing the hearts of the community, which, you know, human resources policies are good, but, you know, getting to the really core of it's gonna take all the groups doing their, their particular work. So I encourage you that. I believe Mr. Vignani had his hand up. I'd like to re defer to him. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, quickly that um, Ruth and her husband reached out to me um, months and months ago, really before um, this whole thing um, got generated and, and we started moving forward with this thing. And, and she has been uh, very interested in this for a long time. Um, I, I think uh, they both bring a great perspective. Um, in her case, where they've dealt with things personally, as well as just being in the school system for 15 years and really dealing with it at at a an immature but raw level, where where you see um, you see things kind of unfiltered, and, and it gives you a, kind of a neat perspective there as well. So, um, so I was going to ask you about that, but in lack of time, I know I, I kind of knew the answer anyways. You know, being in in with the 13 and 14 year olds for that number of years, you see a lot and you probably learn a lot and get perspective outside of your own personal experience um, and what the community is going with. So, um, and then just to note the, the, the interest from, from well before this, this, um, this whole thing really got rolling. So Ruth, thank you. Thank you for thank participating. You, All right, well, thank you everyone. Thank you for um, your thoughtful answers. We will conclude the interviews for this evening for the board and committee and begin at 9.57 on our new business. <laughs> um, so uh, you're welcome to stay with us, but I would direct the board. Uh, we're gonna probably have to shuffle some numbers and get the right stuff on. We have, um, as I said, we're taking a vote on this committee, but uh, we have mostly renewals that are on the table. Um, I would see, I would recommend, why don't we, should we go to the um, to discussion on Board of Health? That's an one position open. Um, and we had those interviews, I believe, at our last meeting. Um, and then save this, the renewals 
um, until we've gone through the um, other can the uh, um, I, I don't want to say contested, but the the open seats. Does anyone have an objection to that? No. Okay. Seeing none. Um, the Board of Health is tab five in your books. I will remind you, we had two wonderful candidates, um, Kelly Roach and Karen Conley. Um, Searching for my notes. Um, all right, does somebody have their notes and wanna, wanna just give a quick synopsis? They both had very different strengths and, um, and great things to offer. Do you have your notes? Because I'm flailing right now. I can now. go through a few. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Kelly Roach was a registered nurse. She works at the school. She works with the Board of Health currently and is very active with, with town stuff that's going on now. Um, Karen Conley has been a nurse for 30 years. She's kind of working as a nurse executive with an IT company. Um, um, you know, and is very active in the, in the mental needs um, um, side of, of, uh, of the industry as well. Um, so, like you said, they were both very, very strong candidates. Mm -hmm. um, and and the Board of Health being rather important this, uh, in this era. Uh, yes, Ms. Curran? Well, what I would like to say, they were both uh, such great candidates, and um, I'd love to be able to leverage both of their experiences. And Kelly is uh, intimately involved already with the Board of Health, so I don't foresee her stepping out. Uh, because as a school nurse, you know, she's been very instrumental in a lot of the different COVID initiatives and um, has seems to, uh, from her um, interview, developed a really nice working rapport with the Board of Health. So I would hope that that wouldn't go away and that we could leverage Karen Conley's, you know, executive experience and her, from um, a different level, um, it may be helpful with some of the more difficult situations that the board faces at times. Um, it's not always just about COVID, unfortunately. You know, there are some tough decisions that are made with septic systems, wind turbine, you know, and, and whatnot. So I, I would recommend, I would like to recommend Karen Conley just because I think, I don't think we're gonna lose Kelly Roach. And it'll be nice to have both of them participate in the board. Does that make sense? I second that. Okay, is that a motion and a second? <laughs> sure, I'll move to appoint Karen Connolly to the Board of Health. I second that. Um, all right, we have a motion uh, on the floor and a second. Is there any further discussion? Um, I would add that I think, um, I think you're right, Ms. Kern, that I think it's one of these wonderful situations. We, we won't make a bad choice, um, but we do have some pretty, um, complicated things that will likely come before the Board of Health um, in the coming in the coming year. So I think her sort of executive level experience would be really beneficial. Um, any further, Mr. Goodrich? Great, I was gonna, I, the, what put me over the top was the, her experience in, in mental health, just as something which is a bit different, a bit, but I just have to say that Kelly Roach, again, a fabulous candidate. And oh, what, absolutely. You know, feel terrible, but no, I, I think I think you're right. So I agree. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Any further comments? All right, this requires a roll call vote. Ms. Devin? Ms. Canfield? Yes. Ms. Divignani? Yes. Ms. Conley? Ms. Conley, you want? You're muted. You're muted, Anna. She's saying yes, she's nodding yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Ms. Karen? Yes. And Mr. Goodrich? Yes. And just to say, you know, that there, there may be an opening on this board next year as well. Um, okay. Okay. Sorry. Good to know. All right. Yeah, Kelly, don't go far. Put the resume right back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, the next open uh, position for the Charter Review Committee, and we had two uh, candidates, Rain Volker and Mike Gibson. And as I think Lorraine rightly pointed out, there are, I believe, it's we do have three open positions, um, which is lovely. You, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, did you skip the cable TV committee? Uh, yeah, we're going to do the renews at the end. 
Didn't we, did we have a candidate? Well, there's, yes, there's, there's, oh. well, there, 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 um, excuse me, I'm sorry. There's one new. And yes, one I, I, I did. Can we, we'll come back to that next. Sorry, okay. I, I wrote, I, my notes are wrong. Yep. All right. We'll do that one next. So charter review, um, Mike Gibson has per, uh, per, um, attended one of uh, the last two meetings and uh, has, uh, has really been engaged and I, I don't think we scared him away with all of our, our, uh, <laughs> our wonkiness in those conversations. So he's great. And um, I personally thought that Raymond also offered a lot of depth to the work. Um, it's, we're, we're, running, we're running on that committee pretty quickly on trying to get through the first wave. So I would recommend that, um, I would recommend putting both on, but I'd like to hear what the board has to say. Uh, uh, go ahead, Kevin. Go ahead, Ms. Conley. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I thought that in particular, uh, Mr. Volker with his experience in Connecticut was very strong. And I think I can see him being useful going forward for quite a bit, so. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, more, Ms. Curran, did you wanna add anything? Nothing different. Nothing different, all right. Um, I actually read, since now I'm reading the charter in depth, I can make a motion. So I'd like to make a motion that the uh, board appoint both Raymond Volker and Mike Gibson to the charter review committee. And all the words we're supposed to say with that. Second. Second by Mr. Vignani. Any further discussion, comments? All right, roll call vote. Um, Ms. Canfield. Yes. Mr. Vignani. Yes. Ms. Conley? Yes. Ms. Curran? Yes. Mr. Goodrich? Yes. Thank you, gentlemen, and welcome to the board, the 5 0 vote. Going back to cable TV. Um, yeah, I did. So we, yeah, I'm sorry, we did. We had James Hardy, who was a great candidate uh, for the one open spot, right? I don't have my book, so correct, please correct me if I'm misremembering. That's correct. Yep, okay. that's correct. Um, would anyone like to speak like on a motion? Oh, all right, we'll go in motion. <laughs> uh, move to appoint James Hardy to the Cable TV Committee for a term of three years or until a successor is named and completion of the conflict of interest law online training program is completed within 30 days. Second. By Karen, seconded by Ms. Connolly. Any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call vote. Ms. Canfield. Yes. Mr. Vignali. Yes. Ms. Conley. Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. And Mr. Goodrich. Yes. Um, and the only other non-renewal, I think, is the Historic Commission. Um, and I did, one of you said to me in the course of the last week, holy moly, we have got, I think, in all of our applications, such a good crop of volunteers this year. So I don't know if it's a, a happy side effect of COVID or people are more engaged, but I'm thrilled. So we had two applicants, Susanna Green, uh, who is our legacy bell ringer at Lawson, and um, Ashley Crozier, who is also extremely strong. Um, does the board like does the board like to comment on these candidates and or make a recommendation? I thought they were both very, very strong. I, I, um, it was really a toss up, but I, I think I would make a motion for um, Ms. Green um, to fill the spot. So I will make a motion. I don't have the, the words. The words. Sorry, Lorraine. I don't have the words to express <laughs> my motion. I have it. All right. Yeah. We're, Lorraine very carefully said to make it, print it out so we had it. Sorry. I Lorraine. have it. I have it. Okay. Move to appoint Susanna Green to the Historic Commission for a term of three years or until a successor is named and completion of the conflict of interest law online training program is completed within 30 days. Moved by. Uh, second. Second by Mr. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, okay. Then uh, we will. Can I, ask, can I ask Lorraine a question? When the, um, is there anybody, yeah. when the next? Summer commission? Yeah. There will be someone coming off the, sh the historic commission next year, yes. Okay. Because right. I know Ashley's been awfully involved too. Okay. So if she, I think she should stay involved. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Um, okay, well, that's a good note that we do have so many good qual candidates. I know, Lorraine, when you follow up to let people know, let them know what's coming up and open and that the board, you know, th these were all tough choices. Mm -hmm. Try to encourage them to stick around. All right, uh, any other comments? All right, then we will um, go to a vote. Roll call vote, please. I thought I did that already, I guess not. Ms. Canfield. <laughs> We've moved on. Uh, yes. Mr. Vignani. Yes. Ms. Conley. Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. Um, all right, so I believe that the rest of the candidates um, for our review and vote tonight are all renewal positions. And um, the first would be, I believe, the Affordable Tr Housing Trust. Nancy Chapman's re um, um, position is up. She would like to renew. Um, Maura, may, you I, may I ask a question you of may. Lorraine? Lorraine, did we vote to reappoint Richard Long to the Cable DP committee? Not I might. Yet. I might have been spacing out at the time, so sorry. Okay, yeah, thank we you. Haven't, we haven't done the uh, renewals yet. So we, not renewals. Do, so we did no. not do it. So we did not do Richard Long. Not yet. Okay, no. I didn't have him checked up. That's why I was asking. Yeah, no, he's, yeah. On, he's on our list right now. Yeah. So the first is a Affordable Housing Trust for Nancy Chapman. Do I have a motion? Sure, she does a great job. She's a great resource to the uh, Affordable Housing Trust. So I will move to reappoint Nancy Chapman to the Affordable Housing Trust for a term of two years or until a successor is named and completion of the Conflict of Interest Law online training program is completed within 30 days. Move by Ms. Karen, second by Ms. Connolly. Any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call vote. Ms. Canfield. Yes. Mr. Vignani. Yes. Ms. Conley. Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. Unanimous. The next is Richard Long, who is, um, uh, his term has expired on the Cable TV Commission, and he has indicated he would like to be, retain his seat and be renewed. Um, is there any comments or questions, or would anyone care to uh, make a motion? He's another great asset to that committee as well. Um, I'm just trying to look for the term. Is it two years or three years? Three. 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 Okay. Move to reappoint uh, Richard Long to the Cable TV Commission for a term of three years or until a successor is named and completion of the Conflict of Interest Law online training program is completed within 30 days. Moved by Ms. Kern. Is there a second? Second. All right. Second by Ms. Conley. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Roll call vote. Ms. Canfield? Yes. Mr. Vignani? Yes. Ms. Conley? Yes. Ms. Curran? Yes. Mr. Goodrich? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Next is Conservation Commission, where Jennifer Foley is up for renewal and would like to continue. Um, who's our liaison to conservation now? I've forgotten, I'm sorry. That would be me, I think. Oh, Ms. that was Karen Conley. <laughs> would you like to comment on Ms. Foley? I, I actually can't, but I, I will say that anyone who's on the Conservation Commission for at least one term and wants to re-up, I'm all for it because it's a really complicated technical committee and the more people we have who have the longevity, it's, it's a good thing for the committee. So I, I'm highly in favor of a reappointment. Great. Uh, do I have a motion? Move to reappoint Jennifer Foley to the Conservation Commission for a term of three years and, or until a successor is named and completion of the conflict of interest law online training program is completed within 30 days. Moved by Ms. Conley, seconded by? Second. Ms. Curran, Second. any further discussion? Seeing none, I will roll call vote, please. Ms. Canfield? Yes. Mr. Vignani? Yes. Ms. Conley? Yes. Ms. Curran? Yes. Mr. Goodrich? Yes. That motion passes unanimously. The next three renewals are within the Economic Development Commission. Um, Susan DePisa, Gina Lee Borns, Bornazin, um, and Paul Barkowitz are all up for renewal and would all like to remain. Um, I will propose that uh, we consider them in one vote if that 
if no one has an objection. And um, I do so because as their liaison, I can say all three of them have thrown themselves into this work and are a great asset. Paul is raised his <coughs> hand to really help with the North Situate sewer conversation. It's in his background. Um, Sue has been the complete um, um, energy and, and, and focus on the Situate Loves Local. And, and Gina is, is a, just has a, a breadth of experience in uh, communication and in organizing. So I would heartily recommend all three be renewed. Okay. Motion. Motion, please. Move to reappoint Sue de Pisa, Gina Lee Bornazian, and Paul Barkowitz to the EDC for a term of three years or until a successor is named in completion of the Conflict of Interest Laws online training program is completed within 30 days. Moved by Ms. Kern. I will second that. And we'll go to roll call vote. Ms. Canfield. Yes. Mr. Vignani. Yes. Ms. Conley. Yes. Ms. Karen? Yes. Mr. Goodrich? Yes. Okay, the next is North River Commission. We have two renewals up for, um, for consideration. It would be Joseph P. Norton, or Joby, as we all know him, and Adria Gallagher, um, who has long served on this committee. I would, and I would uh, recommend that we do them both as one vote as well, unless anyone has an objection. No objection. Um, would anyone like to speak on their behalf on their work? No? Well, I will tell you, Adria has worked a long time and Joby's been a phenomenal asset to this um, commission. So I would make a mo I would entertain a motion for the both of them. Sure. Move, move to reappoint Joseph P. Norton to, and Adria Gallagher to the North River Commission for a term of one year or until a successor is named and completion of the conflict of interest law online training program is completed within 30 days. Moved by Ms. Connolly. Is there a second? Second. second. All right, second by Ms. Curran. Any discussion? Seeing none, um, I'll roll call vote. Ms. Canfield. Yes. Mr. Vignani. Yes. Ms. Conley. Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. Motion passes uh, five zero. The last on my list is for Waterways Commission. Michael Gibbons is up for renewal um, and would like to stay on. Who's the Waterways now? Is that Mark? Hey. Yep, and Michael's also the new chair, so. Uh, <laughs> Might want to keep him around. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, I will move to reappoint Michael Gibbons to the Waterways Commission for a term of three years until a successor is named and completion of the Conflict of Interest Law online training program is completed within 30 days. And by Ms. Curran, is there a second? Second. Second. And by Mr. Goodrich. Uh, no further discussion. Uh, roll call vote, please. Ms. Canfield. Yes. Mr. Vignani. Yes. Ms. Conley. Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. And Mr. Goodrich. Yes. <laughs> Are you drawing out the uh, d d the uh, tension there? The motion passes 5-0. <laughs> I think he went to sleep there for a minute. Um, that concludes our new business on the agenda. Our other business would be liaison reports. Um, does anyone have a report they'd like to? We just met last week, but yeah, I'm gonna... so much has happened. Uh, any other any updates? Okay, we will we'll move Can on we... to correspondence, we... Madam Clerk. Uh, I, we all got a lot of correspondence today about the, um, the diversity committee, and um, so I won't go into that, but um, we did receive correspondence from Situate Community Christmas, uh, year-round giving at the Susan Thippen House, and the uh, Situate Community Christmas is here to help. From stocking stuffers and warm winter coats to utility bills or a tank of gas, Situate Community Christmas is here to help families get through the season and make Christmas magical, and the whole holiday season, I would add. Applications for assistance are currently being accepted. You may be, apply on behalf of your family or for another family. All applications are confidential, and you can go online, situatecommunitychristmas.org, to request help. And they've been wonderful for many, many years, and I highly recommend that if you can make a donation, you should do so. Um, we received yet another um, communication from Plymouth County Cares, which is the COVID fund that uh, Plymouth County um, 
uh, administers that uh, came to the county from the federal government. And I don't think there's anything actually new, but we have received to date a total of $536,332.74, which puts us up among the higher um, communities that uh, have received funding. And I credit Town Hall for being aggressive in uh, applying for as much of that money as possible. So that's what I have. Great, thank you, Ms. Connolly. Um, we, do we have minutes to approve? Not tonight. I didn't think so, okay. Um, then that leaves for adjournment. Um, Lorraine, do we have any documents or will that wait till next week? Next week. Okay. I just need, I, I'm sorry, I just need the board and committee books back so I can, so Allison and I can prepare everything for Tuesday for you. Great, thank Great. you so much for all the hard work on that. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a question for Lorraine. Yes. Lorraine, am I the only scofflaw who has not returned the book that we read <laughs> for the uh, community library read? Yes. Can you get it back? We've been looking I'm for that. I'm the only scofflaw. I outed myself. <laughs> I'll return it tomorrow. Thank um, you. Only if you walk, you need to walk down the hall going, shame, shame. <laughs> the library <laughs> will appreciate that. I just found it in a pile and I went, oh no. <laughs> so I'll bring it back tomorrow. Great. Thank you. Yep. Great. Thank you, everybody, for having me. Here, here I was blaming Jim Bedreau. <laughs> Who, me? <laughs> no, I was blaming Jim, but he's no, off the hook. It was me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, thank you, everybody, for ha squeezing in an extra meeting. I'm glad we did this um, separately, and it was really, we have a lot to talk about when uh, we finish our interviews. So I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Anyone? So Nobody? moved. <laughs> Moved by Mr. Vignani, seconded by Ms. Curran. Roll call vote, please, Ms. Ms. Canfield. Yes. Mr. Vignani. Yes. Ms. Conley. Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, man behind the curtain. Good night, Seth.